Chapter 9 The old lab was not used for anything much except detention, but there was still a faint smell of old science clinging to it, from generations of experiments which had gone wrong. Charles slid onto the splintery back bench and propped Mr. Towers's awful book against the stump of an old gas pipe. The comics were there, stacked on the shelf underneath, just below a place where someone had spent industrious hours carving Cadwallader is a bag on the bench top. The rest of the people in the room were all at the front. They were mostly from 5B or 5C and probably did not know about the comics. Simon came in. Charles gave him a medium-strength glare to discourage him from the back bench. Simon went and sat haughtily in the very middle of the middle bench. Good. Then Mr Wentworth came in. Not so good. Mr Wentworth was carefully carrying a steaming mug of coffee, which everyone in the room looked at with mute envy. It would have to be Mr Wentworth, Charles thought resentfully. Mr Wentworth set his cup of coffee carefully down on the teacher's bench and looked around to see who was doing time. He seemed surprised to see Simon, and not at all surprised to see Charles. Anyone need paper for lines? he asked. Charles did. He went up with most of 5B and was handed a lump of someone's old exam. The exam had used only one side of the paper, so, Charles supposed, it made sense to use the other side for lines. But it did, all the same, seem like a deliberate way of showing people how pointlessly they were wasting time here. Wasting waste paper. And Charles could tell, as Mr Wentworth gave the paper out, that he was in his nastiest and most harrowed mood. Not good at all, Charles thought, as he slid back behind the back bench. For though Charles had not particularly thought about it, it was obvious to him that he was going to use witchcraft to copy out Mr Towers' awful book. What was the point of being a witch if you didn't make use of it? But he would have to go carefully with Mr Wentworth in this mood. The door opened. Teresa made an entry with her crowd of supporters. Mr Wentworth looked at them. Come in, he said. So glad you were able to make it, all of you. Sit down, Delia. Find a seat, Karen. Heather, Deborah, Julia, Teresa and the rest can no doubt all squeeze in around Simon. We haven't got detention, sir, Delia said. We just came to bring Teresa, Deborah explained. Why, didn't she know the way, said Mr Wentworth. Well, you all have detention now. But, sir, we only came... Unless you get out this second, said Mr Wentworth. Teresa's friends vanished. Teresa looked angrily at Simon, who was sitting in the place she would otherwise have chosen, and carefully selected a place at the end of the bench just behind him. This is all your fault, she whispered to Simon. Drop dead, said Simon. It was, Charles thought, rather a pity that Nirupam had managed to break the Simon Says spell. Silence descended. The woeful, restless silence of people who wished they were elsewhere. Mr Wentworth opened a book and picked up his coffee. Charles waited until Mr Wentworth seemed thoroughly into his book and then brought out his ballpoint pen. He ran his finger and thumb down it, just as he had done with Simon's hair, down and down again. Write lines, he thought to it. Write five hundred lines out of this book. Write lines. Then, very grudgingly, he wrote out the first sentence for it. What ripping fun, exclaimed Watts Minor. I'm down for scrum half this afternoon. To show it what to do. Then he cautiously let go of it. And the pen not only stood where he had left it, but began to write industriously. Charles arranged Mr Towers' book so that it would hide the scribbling pen. Then, with a sigh of satisfaction, he fetched out one of the comics and settled down as comfortably as Mr Wentworth. 
Five minutes later, he thought a thunderbolt hit him. The pen fell down and rolled on the floor. The comic was snatched away. His right ear was in agony. Charles looked up mistily, because his glasses were now hanging from his left ear, to find Mr Wentworth towering over him. The pain in his ear was from the excruciatingly tight grip Mr Wentworth had on it. Get up, Mr Wentworth said, dragging at the ear. Charles got up perforce. Mr Wentworth led him like that by the ear with his head painfully on one side to the front of the room. Halfway there, Charles's glasses fell off his other ear. He almost didn't have the heart to catch them. In fact, he only saved them by reflex. He was fairly sure he would not be needing them much longer. At the front, he could see just well enough to watch Mr Wentworth cram the comic one-handed into the waste paper basket. Let that teach you to read comics in detention, Mr Wentworth said. Now come with me. He led Charles, still by the ear, to the door. There he turned around and spoke to the others in the room. If anyone so much as stirs, he said, while I'm gone, he or she will be here for double time every night till Christmas. Upon this, he towed Charles outside. He towed Charles some distance up the covered way outside. Then he let go of Charles's ear, took hold of his shoulders, and commenced shaking him. Charles had never been shaken like that. He bit his tongue. He thought his neck was breaking. He thought the whole of him was coming apart. He grabbed his left hand and his right one to try and hold himself together, and felt his glasses snap into two pieces. That was it, then. He could hardly breathe when Mr Wentworth at last let go of him. I warned you, Mr Wentworth said, furiously angry. I called you to my room and purposely warned you. Are you a complete fool, boy? How much more frightened do you have to be? Do you need to be in front of the Inquisitors before you stop? I, gasped Charles, I... He had never known Mr Wentworth could be this angry. Mr Wentworth went on in a lifting undertone that was far more frightening than shouting. Three times, three times today, to my knowledge, you've used witchcraft, and the Lord knows how many times I don't know about. Are you trying to give yourself away? Have you the least idea what risk you run? What kind of a show-off are you? All the shoes in the school this morning. That, that was a mistake, sir. Charles panted. I, I was trying to find my spikes. A stupid thing to waste witchcraft on, said Mr Wentworth. And not content with a public display like that, you then go and cast spells on Simon Silverson. How did you know that was me? said Charles. One look at your face, boy. And what's more, you were sitting there letting the unfortunate Nan Pilgrim take the blame. I call that thoroughly selfish and despicable. And now this writing lines where anyone could see you. You are lucky, let me tell you, boy, very lucky not to be down at the police station at this moment waiting for the Inquisitor. You deserve to be there, don't you? He shook Charles again. Don't you? Yes, sir, said Charles. And you will be, said Mr Wentworth, if you do one more thing. You're to forget about witchcraft, understand? Forget about magic. Try to be normal, if you know what that means. Because I promise you that if you do it again, you will be really in trouble. Is that clear? Yes, sir, said Charles. Now get back in there and write properly. Mr Wentworth shoved Charles in front with one hand, and Charles could feel that hand shaking with anger. Frightening though that was, Charles was glad of it. He could barely see a thing without his glasses. When Mr Wentworth burst back with him into the old lab, the room was just a large, fuzzy blur. But he could tell everyone was looking at him. The air was thick with people thinking, I'm glad it wasn't me. Get back to your seat, Mr Wentworth said, and let go of Charles with a sharp push.
Charles felt his way through swimming coloured blurs down to the other end of the old lab. Those crooked white squares must be the book and the old exam paper. But his pen, he remembered, had fallen on the floor. How was he to find it in this state, let alone write with it? What are you standing there for? Mr Wentworth barked at him. Put your glasses on and get back to work. Charles jumped with terror. He found himself diving for his seat and hooking his glasses on as he dived. The world clicked into focus. He saw his pen lying almost under his feet and bent to pick it up. But surely, he thought, as he was half under the bench, his glasses had been in two pieces. He had heard a dreadfully final snapping noise. He thought he had felt them come apart. He put his hand up hurriedly and felt his glasses. There was no point taking them off and looking, because then he would not be able to see. They felt all right, entire and whole. Either he had made a mistake, or the plastic had snapped and not the metal inside. Much relieved, Charles sat up with the pen in his hand and stared at what it had written by itself. I am Watts down scrum miner ripping this fun afternoon. I fun miner am half this afternoon Watts. And so on for two whole pages. It was no good. Mr Towers was bound to notice. Charles sighed and began writing. Perhaps he should stop doing witchcraft. Nothing seemed to go right. Consequently, the rest of the evening was rather quiet. Charles sat in Devi running his thumb over the fat cushion of blister on his finger, not wanting to give up witchcraft and knowing he dared not go on. He felt such a mixture of regret and terror that it quite bewildered him. Simon was subdued too. Brian Wentworth was back, sitting scribbling industriously, with one eye still turned slightly inward, but Simon seemed to have lost his desire to hit Brian for the time being, and Simon's friends followed Simon's lead. Nan kept quiet also, because of what Nirobam had said, but however hard she reasoned with herself, she could not get rid of that bubbling inner confidence. It was still with her in the dormitory that night. It stayed, in spite of Delia, Deborah, Heather and the rest, who began on her in their usual way. It was a bit much, that spell on Simon. Really, Nan, I know we asked you, but you should think first. Look what he did to Teresa, and she lost her knitting over it. And Nan, instead of submitting or apologising as she usually did, said, What's put it into your pretty little heads that that spell was mine? Because we know you're a witch, said Heather. Of course, said Nan. But what gave you the idea I was the only one? You think, Heather, instead of just opening your little pink mouth and letting words trickle out. I told you, it takes time to make a spell. I told you about picking herbs and flying around and chanting, didn't I? And I left out the way you have to catch bats. That takes ages, even on a fast modern broomstick, because bats are so good at dodging. And you were with me in the bathroom, and with me all the time, all this last week, and you know I haven't had time to catch bats or pick herbs, and you've seen I haven't been muttering and incantating. So you see, it wasn't me. She could tell they were convinced, because they all looked so disappointed. Heather muttered, and you said you couldn't fly that broomstick. But she said nothing more. Nan was pleased. She seemed to have shut them up without losing her reputation as a witch. All except Karen. Karen was newly admitted to the number of Teresa's friends. That made her very zealous. Well, I think you should work a spell now, she said. Teresa's lost a pair of booties she spent hours knitting, and I think the least you can do is get them back for her. No trouble at all, Nan said airily. But does Teresa want me to try? Teresa finished buttoning her pyjamas and turned away to brush her hair. She's not going to try, Karen, 
she said. I should be ashamed to get my knitting back that way. Lights out, said a monitor at the door. Do these belong to anyone? The caretaker found them in his dog's basket. She held up two small grey fluffy things with holes in them. The look everyone gave Nan as Teresa went to claim her booties made Nan wonder if she had been wise to talk like that. And I don't even really know if I'm still a witch, she thought as she got into bed. I'll keep my mouth shut in the future. And that broomstick stays on top of the cupboard. I don't care if I did promise it. Right in the middle of the night, she was awakened by something prodding at her. Nan, in her sleep, rolled out of the way and rolled again, until she woke up in the act of falling out of bed. There was a swift swishing noise. Something she only dimly saw in the near dark dived over her and then dived under her. Nan woke up completely to find herself six feet off the floor and doubled over the broomstick, with her head hanging down one side and her feet the other. The knobby handle was a painful thing to be draped over. Nevertheless, Nan began to laugh. I am a witch after all, she thought joyfully. Put me down, you big flawed, she whispered. You were just playing for sympathy, pretending you needed a rider, weren't you? Put me down and go and fly yourself. The broomstick's answer was to rise up to the ceiling. Nan's bed looked like a small, dim oblong from there. She knew she would miss it if she tried to jump off. You big bully, she said. I know I promised, but that was before... The broom drifted suggestively towards the window. Nan became alarmed. The window was open because Teresa believed in fresh air. She had visions of herself being carted over the countryside, draped over the stick in nothing but pyjamas. She gave in. All right, I'll fly you. But let me go down and get some blankets first. I'm not going to go like this. The broom whirled around and swooped back to Nan's bed. Nan's legs flew out and she landed on the mattress with a bounce. The broom did not trust her in the least. It hovered over her while she dragged the pink school blankets from her bed and as soon as she had wrapped them around her, it made quite sure of her by darting underneath her and swooping up to the ceiling again. Nan was thrown backwards. She nearly ended hanging underneath again. Go carefully, she whispered. Let me get settled. The broom hovered impatiently while Nan tried to balance herself and get comfortable. She did not dare take too long over it. All the swooping and whispering were disturbing the other girls. Quite a few of them were turning over and murmuring crossly. Nan tried to sit on the broom and toppled over sideways. She got tangled in her blankets. In the end, she simply fell forward on her face and settled for lying along the handle again in a bundle of blanket with her feet hooked up on the brush. Before she had even gotten comfortable like that, the broomstick swooped to the window, nudged it further open and darted outside. There was pitch black night out there. It was cold with a drizzle of rain falling. Nan wrinkled her face against it and tried to get used to being high up. The broom flew with a strange choppy movement, not altogether pleasant for a person lying on her face. Nan talked to take her mind off it. How is this, she said, for romantic dreams come true? I always thought of myself flying a broomstick on a warm summer night, outlined against an enormous moon with a nightingale or so singing its head off. And look at us! Underneath her, the broomstick jerked. It was obviously a shrug. Yes, I dare say it is the best we can do, Nan said. But I don't feel very glamorous like this, and I'm getting wet. I bet Dulcinea Wilkes used to sit on her broom, gracefully, side saddle probably, with her long hair flowing out behind. And because it was London, she probably wore an elegant silk dress, with lots of lacy petticoats showing from underneath. Did you know I was descended from Dulcinea Wilkes? The rippling underneath her might have been the broom's way of nodding, but it could have been laughing at the contrast. Nan found she could see in the dark now. 
She looked down and blenched. The broomstick felt very flimsy to be this high. It had soared and turned while she was talking, so that the square shapes of the school were a long way below and to one side. The pale spread of the playing field was directly underneath, and beyond that Nan could see the entire town filling the valley ahead. The houses were all dark, with orange chains of streetlights in between, and in spite of the drifting drizzle, Nan could see as far as the blackness of Larwood Forest on the hill opposite. Let's fly over the forest, she said. The broom swept off. Once you got used to it, it really would be a nice feeling, Nan told herself firmly, blinking against the drizzle. Secret, silent flight. It was in her blood. She held the end of the broom handle in both hands and tried to point it at the town. But the broom had other ideas. It wanted to go around the edge of the town. The result was that they flew sideways, jolting a little. Fly over the houses, said Nan. The broom gave a shake that nearly sent her tumbling off. No. I suppose someone might look up and see us, Nan agreed. All right, you win again, bully. And it occurred to her that her dreams of flying against a huge full moon were really the most arrant romantic nonsense. No witch in her senses would do that, for fear the Inquisitors might see her. So they swooped over fields and across the main road in a rush of rain. The rain at first came at Nan's face in separate drops out of the orange haze made by the streetlights. Then it was just wetness out of darkness as they reached Larwood Forest, and the wetness brought a smell with it of autumn leaves and mushroom. But even a dark wood is not quite black at night. Nan could see paler trees, which still had yellow leaves, and she could clearly see mist caused by the rain smoking out above the trees. Some of it seemed to be real smoke. Nan smelled fire distinctly, a wet fire burning smokily. She suddenly felt rather quiet. I say, that can't be a bonfire, can it? If it's after midnight, it is Halloween, isn't it? The idea seemed to upset the broom. It stopped with a jerk. For a second, its front end tipped downwards as if it were thinking of landing. Nan had to grip hard in order not to slide off head first. Then it began actually flying backwards, wagging its brush in agitated sweeps so that Nan's feet were swirled from side to side. Stop it, she said. I shall be sick in a minute. They did, she knew, sometimes burn witches' brooms with the witch they belonged to. So she was not surprised when the broom swung around away from the smell of smoke and began flying back towards the school in a stately sort of way, as if that was the way it had meant to go all along. You don't fool me, she said, but you can go back if you want. I'm soaked. The broom continued on its wet and stately way, high above the fields and the main road, until the pale flatness of the playing field appeared beneath them once more. Nan was just thinking that she would be in bed any minute now, when a new notion seemed to strike the broom. It dived a sickening fifty feet and put on speed. Nan found herself hurtling over the field about twenty feet up and oozing off backwards with the speed. She hung on and shouted to it to stop. Nothing she said made any difference. The broom continued to hurtle. Oh, really? Nan gasped. You are the most willful thing I've ever known. Stop! The rain beat in her face, but she could see something ahead now all the same. It was something dark against the grass, and it was quite big, too big for a broom, although it was flying too, floating gently away across the field. The broom was racing towards it. As they plunged on, Nan saw that the thing was flat underneath, with the shape of a person on top of it. It got bigger and bigger. Nan decided it could only be a small carpet with a man sitting on it. She tugged and jerked at the broom handle, 
but there seemed nothing she could do to stop the broom. The broom plunged gladly up alongside the dark shape. It was a man on a small carpet. The broom swooped around it, wagging its end so hard that Nan bit her tongue. It nuzzled and nudged and jogged at the carpet, jerking Nan this way and that as it went. And the carpet seemed equally delighted to meet the broom. It was jiggling and flapping and rippling so that the man on top of it was rolled this way and that. Nan shrank down and clung to the broom, hoping that she just looked like a roll of blankets to whoever this witch on a carpet was. But the man was becoming annoyed by the antics of the carpet and the broom. Can't you control that thing yet? he snapped. Nan shrank down even further. Her bitten tongue made it hard to speak anyway, and she was almost glad of it. She knew that voice. It was Mr. Wentworth's. And I told you never to ride that thing in term time, Brian, Mr. Wentworth said. When Nan still did not say anything, he added, I know, I know, but this wretched hearthrug insists on going out every night. This is worse and worse, Nan thought. Mr. Wentworth thought she was Brian. So Brian must be... With a fierce effort, she managed to wrench the broom around away from the hearthrug. With an even fiercer effort, she got it going again towards the school. By kicking it hard with her bare toes, she kept it going. When she was some way away, she risked turning around and whispering, Sorry! She hoped Mr. Wentworth would go on thinking she was Brian. Mr. Wentworth called something after her as the broomstick lumbered away, but Nan did not even try to hear what it was. She did not want to know. She could still barely believe it. Besides, she needed all her attention to make the broom go. It was very reluctant. It flew across the field in a dismal, trudging way, which reminded Nan irresistibly of Charles Morgan, but at least it went. Nan was pleased to discover that she could control it after all when she had to. It made particularly heavy weather of lifting Nan upwards to her dormitory window. She almost believed it groaned. Some of the difficulty may have been real. All Nan's pink school blankets were soaked through by now, and they must have weighed a great deal. But Nan remembered what an act the broom had put on in the afternoon and resolved to be pitiless. She drummed with her toes again. Up went the broom, through the dark, rainy night, up and up the wall, until at last they were outside the half-open dormitory window. Nan helped the broom shoulder the window open wider and then swooped to the floor on her stomach. What a relief, she thought. Someone whispered, I put dry blankets on your bed. Nan nearly fainted. After a pause to recover, she rolled herself off the broom and knelt up in her sopping blankets. A dim figure in regulation school pyjamas was standing in front of her, bending down a little, so that Nan could see the hair was curly. Heather? No, don't be daft. Estelle? Estelle? she whispered. Hush, whispered Estelle. Come and help put these blankets in the airing cupboard. We can talk there. But the broom, Nan whispered. Send it away. A good idea, Nan thought. If only the broom would obey. She picked it up, shedding soaking blankets as she went, and carried it to the window. Go to the groundsman's shed, she told it in a severe whisper, and sent it off with a firm shove. Knowing the kind of broom it was, she would not have been surprised if it had simply clattered to the ground. But it obeyed her, rather to her astonishment, or at least it flew off into the rainy night. Estelle was already lugging the heap of blankets to the door. Nan tiptoed to help her. Together they dragged the heap down the passage and into the fateful bathroom. There Estelle shut the door and daringly turned on the light. It'll be all right if we don't talk too loud, she said. I'm awfully sorry. 
Teresa woke up while I was making your bed. I had to tell her you'd been sick. I said you were in the bathroom being sick again. Can you remember that if she asks tomorrow? Thanks, said Nan. That was kind of you. Did I wake you going out? Yes, but it was training mostly, Estelle said. She opened the big airing cupboard. If we fold these blankets and put them right at the back, no one's going to find them for weeks. They might even be dry by then. But with this school's heating, there's no relying on that. It was not a quick job. They had to take out the piles of pale pink dry blankets stacked in the cupboard, fold the heavy bright pink wet ones, put them in at the back, and then put all the dry ones back to hide them. Why did you say training woke you up? Nan asked Estelle as they worked. Training with the witch's underground escape route, said Estelle. My mum used to belong to it, and I used to help her. It took me right back when I heard you going out, though it was usually people coming in that used to wake me up, and I knew you'd be wet when you came back and need help. Mum brought me up to think of everything like that. We used to have witches coming in on brooms at all hours of the night, poor things. Most of them were as wet as you, and much more frightened, of course. Hold the blanket down with your chin. That's the best way to get it folded. Why did your mum send you away to this school? Nan asked. You must have been such a help. Estelle's bright face saddened. She didn't. The Inquisitors sent me. They had a big campaign and broke up all our branch of the organisation. My mum got caught. She's in prison now for helping witches. But... Estelle's soft brown eyes looked earnestly into Nan's face. Please don't say... I couldn't bear anyone else to know. You're the only one I've ever told. To ten. The next morning, Brian Wentworth did not get up. Simon threw a pillow at him as he lay there, but Brian did not stir. Wakey, wakey, Brian, Simon said. Get up or I'll strip your bed off. When Brian still did not move, Simon advanced on his bed. Let him alone, Charles said. He was ill yesterday. Anything you say, Charles, said Simon. Your word is my command. And he pulled all the covers off Brian's bed. Brian was not in it. Instead, there was a line of three pillows, artfully overlapped to give the shape of a body. Everyone gathered around and stared. Ronald West bent down and looked under the bed, as if he thought Brian might be there, and came up holding a piece of paper. Here, he said, this must have come off with the bedclothes. Take a look. Simon snatched the paper from him. Everyone else craned and pushed to see it too. It was written in capital letters, in ordinary blue ballpoint, and it said, Ha ha, I have got Brian Wentworth in my power. Signed, The Witch. The slightly tense look on Simon's face gave way to righteous concern. He had known at once that Brian's disappearance had nothing to do with him. We're not going to panic, he said. Someone get the master on duty. There was instant emergency. Voices jabbered, rumours roared. Charles fetched Mr Crossley, since everyone else seemed too astonished to think. After that, Mr Crossley and monitors came and went, asking everyone when they had last seen Brian. People from the other dormitories crowded in the doorway, calling comments. Everyone was very eager to say something, but nothing very useful came out. A lot of people had noticed Brian was pale and cross-eyed the day before. Somebody said he had been ill and gone to the matron. A number of other people said he had come back later and seemed very busy writing. Everyone swore Brian had gone to bed as usual the night before. Long before Mr Crossley had sorted even this much out, Charles was tiptoeing hastily away downstairs. He felt sick. 
Up to last night, he had supposed Brian was trying to get himself invalided out of school. Now he knew better. Brian had run away, just as he had said he would. And he had taken the advice Charles had given him in the middle of the night before and confused his trail. But what had given Brian the idea of blaming the witch? Could it have been the shoes and the sight of Charles muttering over some hairs from Simon's comb? Charles was fairly sure it was. As Charles pushed through the boys in the corridor, he heard the words witch and Nan Pilgrim coming from all sides. Fine, as long as they went on blaming Nan. But would they? Charles took a look at his burned finger as he went down the stairs. The transparent, juicy cushion of blister on it was fatter than ever. It hurts to be burned. Charles went the rest of the way down at a crazy gallop. He too remembered Brian scribbling and scribbling during Devi. Brian must have written pages. If there was one word about Charles Morgan in those pages, he was going to make sure no one else saw them. He pelted along the corridors. He flung himself into the classroom, squawking for breath. Brian's desk was open. Nirupam was bending over it. He did not seem in the least surprised to see Charles. Brian has been very eloquent, he said. Come and see. Behind the raised lid of the desk, Nirupam had lined up six exercise books, each of them open to a double page of hurried blue scrawl. Help, 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 Charles read in the first. The witch has the evil eye on me. Help, I am being dragged away. I know not where. Help, my mind is in thrall. Nameless deeds are being forced upon me. Help, the world is turning grey. The spell is working. Help, and so on, for the whole two pages. There's yards of it, said Charles. I know, said Nirupam, opening Brian's French book. This is full of it too. Does it give names? Charles asked tensely. Not so far, said Nirupam. Charles was not going to take Nirupam's word for that. He picked up each book in turn and read the scrawl through. Help! Wild chanting and horrible smells fill my ears. Help! I can feel myself going. The witch's will is strong. I must obey. Grey humming and horrible words. Help! My spirit is being dragged from Timbuktu to Uttar Pradesh. To utter destruction, I mean. Help! It went on like this for all six books. Enough of it was in capitals for Charles to be quite sure that Brian had written the note under his bed himself. After that, he read each of the rest of Brian's books as Nirupam finished with it. It was all the same kind of thing. To Charles's relief, Brian named no names. But there was still Brian's journal at the bottom of the pile. If he said anything definite, it will be in this, Nirupam said, picking up the journal. Charles reached out for it too. If necessary, he was going to force it out of Nirupam's hands by witchcraft. Or was it better just to make all the pages blank? But did he dare do either? His hand hesitated. As Charles hesitated, they heard Mr. Crossley's voice out in the corridor. Charles and Nirupam frantically crammed the books back into Brian's desk and shut it. They raced to their own desks, sat down, got out books, and pretended to be busy finishing Devi from the night before. You boys should be going along to breakfast now, Mr Crossley said when he came in. Go along. Both of them had to go without a chance of looking at Brian's journal. Charles wondered why Nirupam looked so frustrated, but he was too frightened on his own account to bother much about Nirupam's feelings. In the corridor outside the dining hall, Mr Wentworth rushed past them, looking even more harrowed than usual. 
Inside the dining hall, the rumour was going around that the police had just arrived. You wait, Simon said knowingly. The Inquisitor will be here before dinner time. You'll see. Nirupam slid into a seat beside Nan. Brian has written in all his school books about a witch putting a spell on him, he murmured to her. Nan hardly needed this to show her the trouble she was in. Karen and Delia had already asked her several times what she had done to Brian, and Teresa had added, not looking at Nan, Some people can't leave people alone, can they? But he didn't name any names, Nirupam muttered, also not looking at Nan. Brian didn't need to name names, Nan thought desperately. Everyone else would do that for him. And if that was not enough, Estelle knew she had been out on the broomstick last night. She looked around for Estelle, but Estelle seemed to be avoiding her. She was at another table. At that, the last traces of witchy inner confidence left Nan completely. For once in her life, she had no appetite for breakfast. Charles was not much better. Whatever he tried to eat, the fat blister on his finger seemed to get in the way. At the end of breakfast, another rumour went around. The police had sent for tracker dogs. A short while after this, Miss Hodge arrived to find the school in an uproar. It took her some time to find out what had happened, since Mr Crossley was nowhere to be found. When Miss Phillips finally told her, Miss Hodge was delighted. Brian Wentworth had vanished. That is, Miss Hodge thought hastily, it was very sad and worrying, of course, but it did give her a real excuse to attract Mr Wentworth's attention again. Yesterday had been most frustrating. After Mr Wentworth had brushed aside her generous apology over Charles Morgan, she had not been able to think of any other move towards getting him to marry her. But this was ideal. She could go to Mr Wentworth and be terribly sympathetic. She could enter into his sorrow. The only difficulty was that Mr Wentworth was not to be found any more than Mr Crossley. It seemed that they were both with the police in Miss Cadwallader's study. As everyone went into the hall for assembly, they could see a police van in the quadrangle. Several healthy Alsatians were getting out of it with their pink tongues draped over their large white fangs in a way that suggested they could hardly wait to get on and hunt something. A number of faces turned pale. There was a lot of nervous giggling. It doesn't matter if the dogs don't find anything, Simon could be heard explaining. The Inquisitor will simply run his witch detector over everyone in the class and they'll find the witch that way. To Nan's relief, Estelle came pushing along the line and stood next to her. Estelle! Nan began violently. Not now, Estelle whispered. Wait for the singing. Neither Mr Wentworth nor Miss Cadwallader came into assembly. Mr Brubeck and Mr Towers, who sat in the main chairs instead, did not explain about that, and neither of them mentioned Brian. This seemed to make it all much more serious. Mr Towers chose his favourite hymn. It was, to Nan's misery, he who would valiant be. This hymn always caused Teresa to look at Nan and giggle when it came to to be a pilgrim. Nan had to wait for Teresa to do that before she dared to speak to Estelle, and, she thought, Teresa's giggle was rather nastier than usual. Estelle, Nan whispered, as soon as everyone had started the second verse. Estelle, you don't think I went out last night the way I did because of Brian, do you? I swear I didn't. I know you didn't, Estelle whispered back. What would anyone want Brian for, anyway? But everyone thinks I did. What shall I do? Nan whispered back. It's P.E. second lesson. I'll show you then, said Estelle. Charles was also whispering under cover of the singing to Nirupam. What are witch detectors? Do they work? 
Machines in black boxes, Nirupam said breathily at his hymn book, and they always find a witch with them. Mr. Wentworth had talked about witch detectors too. So, Charles thought, if the rumour was right and the Inquisitor got here before lunchtime, today was the end of Charles. Charles hated Brian, selfish beast. Yes, all right, he had been selfish too, but Brian was even worse. There was only one thing to do now, and that was to run away as well. But those tracker dogs made that nearly impossible. When they got to the classroom, Brian's desk had been taken away. Charles looked at the empty space in horror. Fingerprints, he thought. Nirupam had gone quite yellow. They took it to give the dogs the scent, said Dan Smith. He added thoughtfully, They're trained to tear people to pieces, those police dogs. I wonder if they'll tear Brian up or just the witch. Charles looked at the blister on his finger and realised that burning was not the only thing that hurt. His first thought had been to run away during break. Now he decided to go in P.E. next lesson. He wished there were not a whole lesson in between. That lesson seemed to last about a year, and for most of that lesson policemen were continually going past the windows with dogs on leads. Back and forth they went. Wherever Brian had gone, they seemed to be finding it hard to pick up his scent. By this time, Nan's hands were shaking so that she could hardly hold her pen. Thanks to last night, she knew exactly why Brian had left no scent. It was that double-dealing broomstick. It must have flown Brian out before it came and woke her up. Nan was sure of it. She could have taken the police to the exact spot where Brian was. That was no bonfire she had smelled over Larwood Forest last night. It had been Brian's campfire. The broomstick had brought her right over the spot and then realised its mistake. That's why it had gotten so agitated and tried to fly away backwards. She was so angry with Brian for getting her blamed that she wished she really could tell them where he was. But the moment she did that, she proved that she was a witch and incriminated Mr Wentworth into the bargain. Oh, it was too bad of Brian! Nan just hoped Estelle could think of some kind of rescue before someone accused her, and she started accusing Brian and Mr Wentworth. Just before the end of that lesson, the dogs must have found some kind of scent. When the girls walked around the outside of the school on their way to the girls' locker room to change for P.E., there was not a policeman or a dog in sight. As the line of girls went past the shrubbery, Estelle gently took hold of Nan's arm and pulled her towards the bushes. Nan let herself be pulled. She did not know if she was more relieved or more terrified. It was a little early in the day to find seniors in the shrubbery, but even so, surely somebody would notice. We have to go into town, Estelle whispered as they pushed among the wet bushes, to the old gatehouse. Why? Nan asked thrusting her way after Estelle. Because, Estelle whispered over her shoulder, the lady there runs the larwood branch of the witch's escape route. They came out into the grass beside the huge laurel bush. Nan looked from Estelle's scared face to Estelle's trim blazer and school skirt. Then she looked down at her own plump shape. Different as they were, they were both obviously in Larwood House school uniforms. But if someone sees us in town, they'll report us to Miss Cadwallader. I was hoping, Estelle whispered, that you might be able to change us into ordinary clothes. Nan realised that the only witchcraft she had ever done was to fly that broom. She had not the least idea how you changed clothes. But Estelle was relying on her, and it really was urgent. 
feeling an awful fall, Nan held out both shaking hands and said the first thing remotely like a spell that came into her head. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, out of uniform we go. There was a swirling feeling around her. Estelle was suddenly in a small snowstorm that seemed to be made of little bits of rag. Navy blue rag, then dark rag. The rags settled like burned paper, clinging to Estelle and hanging, and clinging to Nan too. And there they both were in seconds, dressed as witches, in long trailing black dresses, pointed black hats and all. Estelle clapped both hands to her mouth to stop a giggle. Nan snorted with laughter. This won't do. Try again, giggled Estelle. What do you want to wear? Nan asked. Estelle's eyes shone. Riding clothes, she whispered ardently. With a red jumper, please. Nan stretched out her hands again. Now she knew she could do it. She felt quite confident. Agga tagga ragga roast. Wear the clothes you want the most. The rag storm began again. In Estelle's case, it started black and swirled very promisingly into pale brown and red. Around Nan, it seemed to be turning pink. When the storm stopped, there was Estelle, looking very trim and pretty in Jodpa's red sweater and hard hat, with her legs in shiny boots, pointing at Nan with a riding crop and making helpless, bursting noises. Nan looked down at herself. It seemed that the sort of clothes she wanted most was the dress she had imagined Dulcinea Wilkes wearing to ride her broomstick around London in. She was in a shiny pink silk ball dress. The full skirt swept the wet grass. The tight pink bodice left her shoulders bare. It had blue bows up the front and lace in the sleeves. No wonder Estelle was laughing. Pink silk was definitely a mistake for someone as plump as Nan. Why pink? she wondered. Probably she had gotten that idea from the school blankets. She had her hands stretched out to try again when they heard Karen Grigg shouting outside the shrubbery. Estelle! Estelle! Where are you? Miss Phillips wants to know where you've gotten to. Estelle and Nan turned and ran. Estelle's clothes were ideal for sprinting through bushes. Nan's were not. She lumbered and puffed behind Estelle, and wet leaves kept showering her bare shoulders with water. Her sleeves got in her way. Her skirt wrapped around her legs and kept catching on bushes. Just at the edge of the shrubbery, the dress got stuck on a twig and tore with such a loud ripping noise that Estelle whirled around in horror. Wait, panted Nan. She wrenched the pink skirt loose and tore the whole bottom part of it off. She wrapped the torn bit like a scarf around her wet shoulders. That's better. After that, she could keep up with Estelle quite easily. They slipped through onto the school drive and pelted down it and out through the iron gates. Nan meant to stop and change the pink dress into something else in the road outside, but there was a man sweeping the pavement just beyond the gates. He stopped sweeping and stared at the two of them. A little further on, there were two ladies with shopping bags who stared even harder. Nan put her head down in acute embarrassment as they walked past the ladies. She had strips of torn pink silk hanging down and clinging to the pale blue stockings she seemed to have changed her socks into. Below that, she seemed to have given herself pink ballet shoes. "'Will you call for me at my ballet class after you've had your riding lesson?' she said loudly and desperately to Estelle. "'I might, but I'm scared of your ballet teacher,' Estelle said, playing up bravely. They got past the ladies, but there were more people further down the road. The further they got into town, the more people there were. By the time they came to the shops, 
Nan knew she was not going to get a chance to change the pink ball dress. You look awfully pretty, really, Estelle said consolingly. No, I don't. It's like a bad dream, said Nan. In my bad dreams like that, I don't have any clothes on at all, said Estelle. At last, they reached the strange red brick castle, which was the old gatehouse. Estelle, looking white and nervous, led Nan up the steps and under the pointed porch. Nan pulled the large bell pull hanging beside the pointed front door. Then they stood under the arch and waited, more nervous than ever. For a long time they thought nobody was going to answer the door. Then, after nearly five minutes, it opened, very slowly and creaking a great deal. A very old lady stood there, leaning on a stick, looking at them in some surprise. Estelle was so nervous by then that she stuttered, A, a, a way out in the name of Dulcinea, she said. Oh, dear, said the old lady. My dears, I'm so sorry. The Inquisitors broke up the organization here several years ago. If it wasn't for my age, I'd be in prison now. They come and check up on me every week. I daren't do a thing. They stood and stared at her in utter dismay. The old lady saw it. If it's a real emergency, she said, I can give you a spell. That's all I can think of. Would you like that? They nodded dismally. Then wait a moment while I write it down, said the old lady. She left the front door open and hobbled aside to a table at one side of the dark old hall. She opened a drawer in it and fumbled for some paper. She searched for a pen. Then she looked across at them. You know, my dears, in order not to attract attention, you really should look as if you were collecting for charity. I can pretend to be writing you a check. Can either of you manage collecting boxes? I can said Nan. She had almost lost her voice with fright and dismay. She had to cough. She did not dare risk saying spells, standing there on the steps of the old house, up above the busy street. She simply waved a quivering hand and hoped. Instant weight bore her hand down. A mighty collecting tin dangled from her arm, and another dangled from Estelle's. Each was as big as a tin of paint. Each had a huge red cross on one side and chinked loudly from their nervous trembling. That's better, said the old lady, and started very slowly to write. The outsized tins did indeed make Nan and Estelle feel easier while they waited. People passing certainly looked up at them curiously, but most of them smiled when they saw the tins. And they were standing there for quite a long time, because as well as writing very slowly, the old lady kept calling across to them. Do either of you know the Portway Oaks? she called. They shook their heads. Pity, you have to go there to say this said the old lady. It's a ring of trees just below the forest. I'd better draw you a map, then. She drew, slowly. Then she called. I don't know why they're called the oaks. Every single tree there is a beech tree. Later still, she called, Now I'm writing down the way you should pronounce it. The girls still stood there. 
Nan was beginning to wonder if the old lady was really in league with the Inquisitors and keeping them there on purpose, when the old lady at last folded up the paper and shuffled back to the front door. There you are, my dears. I wish I could do more for you. Nan took the paper. Estelle produced a bright, artificial smile. Thanks awfully, she said. What does it do? I'm not sure, said the old lady. It's been handed down in my family for use in emergencies, but no one has ever used it before. I'm told it's very powerful. Like many old people, the old lady spoke rather too loudly. Nan and Estelle looked nervously over their shoulders at the street below, but nobody seemed to have heard. They thanked the old lady politely, and when the front door shut, they went drearily back down the steps, lugging their huge collecting tins. I suppose we'd better use it, said Estelle. We daren't go back now. Seven. Charles jogged around the playing field towards the groundsman's hut. He hoped anyone who saw him would think he was out running for P.E. For this reason, he had changed into his small sky-blue running shorts before he slipped away. When he had time, he supposed he could transform the shorts into jeans or something. But the important thing at the moment was to get hold of that mangy old broom people had been taunting Nan Pilgrim with the other day. If he got to that before anyone noticed he was missing, he could ride away on it and no dog on earth could pick up his trail. He reached the hut in its corner beside the kitchen gardens. He crept around it to its door. At the same moment, Nirupam crept around it from the opposite side, also in sky-blue shorts, and stretched out his long arm for the door too. The two of them stared at one another. All sorts of ideas for things to say streamed through Charles's mind, from explaining he was just dodging P.E. to accusing Nirupam of kidnapping Brian. In the end, he said none of these things. Nirupam had hold of the door latch by then. Bags I the broomstick, Charles said. Only if there are two of them, said Nirupam. His face was yellow with fear. He pulled open the door and dodged into the hut. Charles dived in after him. There was not even the one old broomstick. There were flower pots, buckets, an old roller, a new roller, four rakes, two spades, a hoe, and an old wet mop propped in one of the buckets. And that was all. Who took it? Charles said wildly. Nobody brought it back, said Nirupam. Oh, magic it all, said Charles. What shall we do? Use something else, said Nirupam. Or walk. He seized the nearest spade and stood astride it, bending and stretching his great long legs. Fly, he told the spade. Go on, fly, magic you. Nirupam had the right idea, Charles saw. A witch surely ought to be able to make anything fly. I should think a rake would fly better, he said, and quickly grabbed hold of the wet mop for himself. The mop was so old that it had stuck to the bucket. Charles was forced to put one foot on the bucket and pull before it came loose, and a lot of the head got left behind in the bucket. The result was a stick ending in a scraggly grey stump. Charles seized it and stood astride it. He jumped up and down. Fly, he told the mop. Quick! Nirupam threw the spade down and snatched up the hoe. Together they jumped desperately around the hut. Fly, they panted. Fly! In an old, soggy, dispirited way, the mop obeyed. It wallowed up about three feet into the air 
and wove towards the hut door. Nirupam was wailing in despair when the hoe took off too, with a buck and a rush, as if it did not want to be left behind. Nirupam shot past Charles with his huge legs flailing. It works, he panted triumphantly, and went off in another kangaroo bound towards the kitchen gardens. They were forbidden to go in the kitchen gardens, but it seemed the most secret way out of school. Charles followed Nirupam through the gate and down the gravel path, both of them trying to control their mounts. The mop wallowed and wove. It was like an old, old person feebly hobbling through the air. The hoe either went by kangaroo surges or it slanted and trailed its metal end along the path. Nirupam had to stick his feet out in front in order not to leave a scent on the ground. His eyes rolled in agony. He kept overtaking Charles and dropping behind. When they got to the wall at the end of the garden, both implements stopped. The mop wallowed about in the air. The hoe jittered its end on the gravel. They can't go high enough to get over, said Charles. Now what? That might have been the end of their journey had not the caretaker's dog been sniffing about in the kitchen gardens and suddenly caught their scent. It came racing down the long path towards them, yapping. The hoe and the mop took off like startled cats. They soared over the wall with Charles and Nirupam hanging on anyhow and went bucking off down the fields beyond. They raced towards the main road, the mop surging, the hoe plunging and trailing, clearing hedges by a whisker and missing trees by inches. They did not slow down until they had put three fields between them and the caretaker's dog. They must hate that dog as much as we do, Nirupam gasped. Was it you that did the Simon Says spell? Yes, said Charles. Did you do the birds in music? No, said Nirupam, much to Charles's surprise. I did only one thing, and that was secret. But I daren't stay if the Inquisitors are going to bring a witch detector. They always get you with those. What did you do? said Charles. You know that night all our shoes went into the hall, said Nirupam. Well, we had a feast that night. Dan Smith made me get up the floorboards and get the food out. He says I have no right to be so large and so weak, Nirupam said resentfully, and I was hating him for it when I took the boards up and found a pair of running shoes with spikes hidden there with the food. I turned those shoes into a chocolate cake. I knew Dan was so greedy that he would eat it all himself, and he did eat it. He didn't let anyone else have any. You may have noticed that he wasn't quite himself the next day. So much had happened to Charles that particular day that he could not remember Dan seeming anything at all. He didn't have the heart to explain all the trouble Nirupam had caused him. Those were my spikes, he said sadly. He wobbled along on the mop, rather awed at the thought of iron spikes passing through Dan's stomach. He must have a digestion like an ostrich. The spikes were turned into cherries, said Nirupam. The soles were the cream. The shoes as a whole became what is called a black forest gateau. Here they reached the main road and saw the tops of cars whipping past beyond the hedge. We'll have to wait for a gap in that traffic, Charles said. Stop, he commanded the mop. Stop. Nirupam cried to the hoe. Neither implement took the slightest notice. Since Charles and Nirupam did not dare put their feet down for fear of leaving a scent for the dogs, they could find no way of stopping at all. They were carried helplessly over the hedge. Luckily, the road was down in a slight dip and they had just enough height to clear the whizzing cars. Nirupam frantically bent his huge legs up. Charles tried not to let his legs dangle. Horns honked. He saw faces peering up at them, outraged and grinning. Charles suddenly saw how ridiculous they must look, 
both in their little blue shorts, himself with the disgraceful dirty old mop head wagging behind him, Niropam lunging through the air in bunny hops with a look of anguish on his face. Horns were still sounding as they cleared the hedge on the other side of the road. Oh, help! gasped Niropam. Make for the woods, quick, before somebody gets the police. Larwood Forest was only a short hillside away, and luckily their panic seemed to get through to the mop and the hoe. Both put on speed. The wagging and slewing of the mop nearly threw Charles off. The hoe helped itself along by digging its metal end fiercely into the ground, so that Nirupam went upwards like someone on a pogo stick, yelping at each leap. Horns were still sounding from the road as first Nirupam, then Charles, reached the trees and plunged in among them. By this time, Nirupam was so far ahead that Charles thought he had lost him. Probably just as well, Charles thought. They might be safer going separate ways. But the mop had other ideas. After dithering a bit, as if it had lost the scent, it set off again at top wallow. Charles was wagged around tree trunks and swayed through prickly undergrowth. Finally, he was slewed through a bed of nettles. He yelled. Nirupam yelled too, just beyond the nettles. The hoe tipped him off into a blackberry bush and darted gladly towards an old threadbare broomstick which was leaning on the other side of the brambles. At the sight, the mop threw Charles into the nettles and went bouncing flirtatiously towards the broomstick too, looking just like a granny on an outing. Charles and Niropam picked themselves bad-temperedly up. They listened. The motorists on the road seemed to have got tired of sounding their horns. They looked. Beyond the jumping hoe and the nuzzling mop, there was a well-made campfire. Behind the fire, concealed by more brambles, was a small orange tent. Brian Wentworth was standing by the tent, glowering at them. I thought I'd got at least one of you arrested, Brian said. Get lost, can't you? Or are you trying to get me caught? No, we are not, Charles said angrily. We're... Hey, listen! Somewhere uphill, in the thick part of the wood, a dog gave one whirring, excited bark and stopped suddenly. Birds were clapping up out of the trees, and Charles's straining ears could also hear a rhythmic swishing, as of heavy feet marching through undergrowth. That's the police, he said. You fools! You've brought them down on me! Brian said in a screaming whisper. He grabbed the old broom from between the mop and the hoe, and in one practised jump, he was on the broom and gliding away across the brambles. He did the birds in music, Nirupam said, and snatched the hoe. Charles seized the mop, and both of them set off after Brian, wavering and hopping across the brambles and in among low trees. Charles kept his head down, because branches were raking at his hair, and thought that Nirupam must be right. Those birds had appeared promptly in time to save Brian's having to sing, and a parrot shouting cuckoo was exactly Brian's kind of thing. They were catching up with the broom, not because they wanted to, but because the mop and the hoe were plainly determined to stay with the broom. They must have spent years together in the groundsman's hut, and, Charles supposed irritably, they had got touchingly fond of one another. Nothing he or Nirupam could do would make either implement go a different way. Shortly, Brian was gliding among the trees only a few yards ahead of them. He turned and glared at them. Leave me alone! You've spoiled my escape and made me lose my tent! Go away! It was the mop and the hoe! said Charles. The police are looking for you, not us, Nirupam panted. What did you expect? You were missing. I didn't expect two great idiots crashing about the forest and bringing the police after me, Brian snarled. Why couldn't you stay in school? 
If you didn't want us, you shouldn't have written all that rubbish about a witch putting a spell on you, said Charles. There's an inquisitor coming today because of you. Well, you advise me to do it, Brian said. Charles opened his mouth and shut it again, quite unable to speak for indignation. They were coming to the edge of the woods now. He could see green fields through a mass of yellow hazel leaves, and he tried to turn the mop aside yet again. If they came out of the woods, they would be seen at once. But the mop obstinately followed the broom. As they forced their way among whippy hazel boughs, Nirupam panted severely, You ought to be glad to have some friends with you, Brian. Brian laughed hysterically. Friends? I wouldn't be friends with either of you if you paid me. Everyone in 6B laughs at you. As Brian said this, there was a sudden clamour of dog noises behind them in the wood. A voice shouted something about a tent. It was plain that the police had found Brian's camp. Brian and the broomstick put on speed and surged out into the field beyond. Charles and Nirupam found themselves being dragged anyhow through the hazel boughs as the mop and the hoe tried to keep up. Scratched and breathless, they were whirled out into the field on the side of the woods that faced the town. Brian was some way ahead, flying low and fast downhill towards a clump of trees in the middle of the field. The mop and the hoe surged after him. I know Brian is nasty, but I had always thought it was his situation before this, Nirupam remarked in jerks as the hoe kangaroo hopped down the field. Charles could not answer at once, because he was not sure that a person's character could be separated from his situation in quite this way. While he was wondering how you said this kind of thing aboard a speeding, wallowing mop when you were hanging on with one hand and holding your glasses with the other, Brian reached the clump of trees and disappeared among them. They heard his voice again, shrill and annoyed, echoing out of the trees. Is Brian trying to bring the police after us? Nirupam panted. Both of them looked over their shoulders, expecting men and dogs to come charging out through the edge of the woods. There was nothing. Next moment, they were swishing through low branches covered with carroty beech leaves. The mop and the hoe jolted to a stop. Charles put his nettled legs down and stood up in a windy, rustling space surrounded by pewter-coloured tree trunks. He stared at Estelle Green, looking as if she had mislaid a horse. He stared at Nan Pilgrim in ragged pink silk, with the broomstick hopping and sidling affectionately around her. Brian was standing angrily beside them. Look at this, he said to Charles and Nirupam. The place is alive with you lot. Why can't you let a person run away in peace? Will one of you please shut Brian up, Estelle said with great dignity. We are just about to say a spell that will rescue us all. These trees are called the Portway Oaks, Nan explained, and bit the inside of her cheek in order not to laugh. Nirupam riding a hoe was one of the funniest things she had ever seen. And Charles Morgan's mop looked as if he had slain an old-age pensioner. But she knew she and Estelle looked equally silly, and the boys had not laughed at them. Brian was still talking angrily. Nirupam let the hoe loose to jump delightedly around the broom and clapped one long brown hand firmly over Brian's mouth. Go ahead, he said. And make it quick, said Charles. Nan and Estelle bent over their fluttering piece of paper again. The old lady had written just one strange word three times at the top of the paper. Under that, as she had told them, she had written in shaky capitals how to say this word. Crest O Man C. After that, she had put, Go to Portway Oaks and say word three times. 
the rest of the paper was full of a very wobbly map. Estelle and Nan pronounced the word together three times. Crestomancy, Crestomancy, Crestomancy. Is that all? asked Niropan. He took his hand from Brian's face. Somebody swindled you, Brian said. That's no spell. It seemed as if a great gust of wind hit the clump of trees. The branches all around them lashed and creaked with the strain, so that the air was full of the rushing of leaves. The dead orange leaves from the ground leaped in the air and swirled around them all, around and around, as if the inside of the clump were the centre of a whirlwind. This was followed by a sudden stillness. Leaves stayed where they were, in the air, surrounding everyone. No one could see anything but leaves, and there was not a sound to be heard from anywhere. Then, very slowly, sound began again. There was a gentle rustling as the suspended leaves dropped back to the ground. Where they had been, there was a man standing. He seemed utterly bewildered. His first act was to put his hands up and smooth his hair, which was a thing that hardly needed doing, since the wind had not disturbed even the merest wisp of it. It was smooth and black and shiny as new tar. Having smoothed his hair, this man rearranged his starched white shirt cuffs and straightened his already straight, pale grey cravat. After that, he carefully pulled down his dove mauve waistcoat and equally carefully brushed some imaginary dust off his beautiful dove-grey suit. All the while he was doing this, he was looking from one to the other of the five of them in increasing perplexity. His eyebrows rose higher with everything he saw. They were all thoroughly embarrassed. Niropam tried to hide behind Charles as the man looked at his little blue shorts. Charles tried to slither behind Brian. Brian tried to knock the mud off the knees of his jeans without looking as if he was. The man's eyes turned to Nan. They were bright black eyes, which did not seem quite as bewildered as the rest of the man's face and they made Nan feel that she would rather have had no clothes on at all than a ragged pink ball dress. The man looked on towards Estelle, as if Nan were too painful a sight. Nan looked at Estelle too. Estelle, as she set her hard hat straight, was gazing adoringly up into the man's handsome face. That was all we needed! Nan thought. Evidently, this was the kind of man that Estelle fell instantly in love with. So, not only had they somehow summoned up an over-elegant stranger, but they were no nearer being safe, and to crown it all, there would probably be no sense to be had from Estelle from now on. Bless my soul, murmured the man. He was now staring at the mop, the hoe, and the broom, which were jigging about in a little group like an old folks' reunion. I think you'd definitely better go, he said to them. All three implements vanished with a faint whistling sound. The man turned to Nan. What are we all doing here? he said, a little plaintively. And where are we? Elf. A dog barked excitedly up the hill. Everyone except the stranger jumped. I think we must go now, sir, Niropam said politely. That was a police dog. They were looking for Brian, but I think they're looking for the rest of us now. What do you expect them to do if they find you? The man asked. 
burn us, said Charles, and his thumb ran back and forth over the fat blister on his finger. We're all witches, you see, except Estelle, Nan explained. So if you don't mind us leaving you, said Nirupam. How very barbarous, said the man. I think it would be much better if the police and their dogs simply didn't see this clump of trees where we all are, don't you? He looked vaguely around to see what they thought of this idea. Everyone looked dubious, and Brian downright scornful. I assure you, the man said to Brian, that if you go into the field outside and look, you will not see these trees any more than the police will. If the word of an enchanter is not enough for you, go out and see for yourself. What enchanter? Brian said rudely. But of course no one dared leave the trees. They all waited, with their backs prickling, while the voices of policemen came slowly nearer. Finally, they seemed to be just outside the trees. Nothing, they heard the policemen saying. Everyone go back and concentrate on the woods. Hills and MacIver, you two go down and see what those motorists by the hedge are waving about. The rest of you get the dogs back to that tent and start again from there. After that, the voices all went away. Everyone relaxed a little, and Nan even began to hope that the stranger might be some help. But then he went all plaintive again. Would one of you tell me where we are now? He said. Just outside Larwood Forest, Nan said. Hertfordshire. In England, the British Isles, the world, the solar system, the Milky Way, the universe. Brian said scornfully. Ah, yes, said the man. But which one? Brian stared. I mean, the man said patiently, do you happen to know which world, galaxy, universe, etc.? There happen to be infinite numbers of them. And unless I know which this one is, I shall not find it very easy to help you. This gave Charles a very strange feeling. He thought of outer space and bug-eyed monsters, and his stomach turned over. His eyes ran over the man's elegant jacket, fascinated, trying to make out if there was room under it for an extra pair of arms. There was not. The man was obviously a human being. You're not really from another world, are you? he said. I am precisely that, said the man. Another world full of people just like you, running side by side with this one. There are myriads of them. So which one is this one? As far as most of them knew, the world was just the world. Everyone looked blank, except Estelle. Estelle said shyly, there is one other world. It's the one the witches rescue people send witches into to be safe. Ah, the man turned to Estelle, and Estelle blushed violently. Tell me about this safe world. Estelle shook her head. I don't know any more, she whispered, overwhelmed. Then let's get at it another way, the man suggested. You tell me all the events that led up to you summoning me here. Is Crestomancy your name, then? Estelle interrupted in an adoring whisper. I'm usually called that, yes, said the man. Was it you who summoned me, then? Estelle nodded. Some spell, Brian said jeeringly. Brian was plainly determined not to help in any way. He stayed scornfully silent while the rest of them explained the events which had led up to their being here. Nobody told Crestomancy quite everything. Brian's contemptuous look made it all feel like a pack of lies anyway. Nan did not mention her meeting with Mr Wentworth on his hearthrug. She felt rather noble not saying anything about that, considering the way Brian was behaving. She did not mention the way she had described the food either, though Charles did. 
On the other hand, Charles did not feel the need to mention the Simon Says spell. Nirupam told Crestomency about that, but he somehow forgot to say that Dan Smith had eaten Charles's shoes. And when the rest of them had finished, Crestomancy looked at Brian. Your narrative now, please, he said politely. It was a very powerful politeness. Everyone had thought that Brian was not going to tell anything at all, but grudgingly he did. First, he admitted to causing the birds in music. Then he claimed that Charles had advised him in the night to run away from school and confuse his trail by blaming the witch. And, while Charles was still stuttering with anger over that, Brian coolly explained that he had discovered Charles was a witch the next morning anyway, and got Charles to take him to the matron so that the matron could see the effects of the evil eye at first hand. Finally, more grudgingly still, he confessed that he had written the anonymous note to Mr. Crossley and started everything. Then, as an afterthought, he turned on Nan. And you kept stealing my broomstick, didn't you? It's not yours, it belongs to the school, said Nan. At the same time, Charles was saying angrily to Crestomancy, It's not true I advised him to blame the witch. Crestomancy was staring vaguely up into the beech trees and did not seem to hear. The situation is quite impossible, he remarked. Let us all go and see the old lady who used to run the witch's rescue service. This struck them all as an excellent idea. It was clear the old lady could rescue them if she wanted. They agreed vigorously. Nirupam said, But the police? Invisibly, of course, said Crestomancy. He was still obviously thinking of something else. He turned to walk away between the tree trunks, and as he did so, everyone flicked out of sight. All that could be seen was the rustling circle of autumn beeches. Come along, said Crestomancy's voice. There followed a minute or so of almost indescribable confusion. It started with Nan assuming she had no body and walking into a tree. She was just as solid as ever and knocked herself quite silly for a second. Oh, sorry, she said to the tree. The rest of them somehow forced their way under the low branches and found themselves out in the field. There, the first thing everybody saw was two cars parked almost in the hedge below and a number of people from the cars leaning over the hedge to talk to two policemen. From the way all the people kept pointing up at the woods, it was clear they were describing how they saw two witches ride across the road on a mop and a hoe. That panicked everyone. They all set off the other way towards the town in a hurry. But as soon as they did, they saw that there was no one ahead of them and waited for the rest to catch up. Then they heard someone speak some way ahead and ran to catch up. But of course they could not tell where the people they were running after were. Shortly, nobody knew where anybody was or what to do about it. Perhaps, Crestomancy's voice said out of the air, you could all bring yourselves to hold hands? I have no idea where the old gatehouse is, you see. Thankfully, everyone grabbed for everyone else. Nan found herself holding Brian's hand and Charles Morgan's. She had never thought the time would come when she would be glad to do that. Estelle had managed to be the one holding Crestomancy's hand. That became clear when the line of them began to move briskly down to the path that led into town, and Estelle's voice could be heard in front, piping up in answer to Crestomancy's questions. As soon as there was no chance of anyone else hearing them, Crestomancy began asking a great many questions. He asked who was Prime Minister, and which were the most important countries, and what was the EEC, and how many world wars there had been. Then he asked about things from history. Before long, everyone was giving him answers, and feeling a little superior, because it was really remarkable the number of things Crestomancy seemed not to know. He had heard of Hitler, 
though he asked Brian to refresh his memory about him. But he had only the haziest notion about Gandhi or Einstein, and he had never heard of Walt Disney or reggae. Nor had he heard of Dulcinea Wilkes. Nan explained about Dulcinea and found herself saying with great pride that she was descended from Dulcinea. Why am I saying that? she thought in sudden alarm. I don't really know it's safe to tell him. And yet, as soon as she thought that, Nan began to see why she had said it. It was the way Crestomancy was asking those questions. It reminded Nan of the time she had kept coming out in a rash and her aunt had taken her to a very important specialist. The specialist had worn a very good suit, though it was nothing like as beautiful as Crestomancy's, and he had asked questions in just the same way, trying to get at Nan's symptoms. Remembering this specialist made Nan feel a lot more hopeful. If you thought of Crestomancy, in spite of his vagueness and his elegance, as a sort of specialist trying to solve their problems, then you could believe that he might just be able to help them. He was certainly a strong and expert witch. Perhaps he could make the old lady send them somewhere really safe. When the path led them into the busy streets of the town, Crestomancy stopped asking questions, but it was clear to Nan that he went on finding symptoms. He made everyone stop while he examined a truck parked by the supermarket. It was just an ordinary truck with Leyland on the front of it and Heinz means beans on the side. But Crestomancy murmured, Good Lord, as if he was really astonished, before dragging them over to look through the windows of the supermarket. Then he towed them up and down in front of some cars. This part was really frightening. The car windows, the hubcaps and the glass of the supermarket all showed faint, misty reflections of the six of them. They were quite sure some of the people who were shopping would notice any second. At last, Crestomancy let Estelle drag him up the street as far as the tatty drapers, where nobody ever seemed to buy anything. How long have you had decimal currency? he asked. While they were telling him, the misty reflection in the draper's window showed his tall shape bending to look at some packets of tights and a dingy blue nylon nightdress. What are these stockings made of? Nylon, of course, snapped Charles. He was wondering whether to let go of Nan's hand and run away. Estelle, feeling much the same, heaved on Crestomancy's hand and led them all in a rush to the doorway of the old gatehouse. She dragged them up the steps and hurriedly rang the bell before Crestomancy could ask any more questions. There was no need to disturb her, Crestomancy remarked. As he said it, the pointed porch dissolved away around them. Instead, they were in an old-fashioned drawing room full of little tables with bobbly cloths on and ornaments on the cloth. The old lady was reaching for her stick and trying to lever herself out of her chair, muttering something about an endless stream of callers today. Crestomancy flicked into sight, tall and elegant, and somehow very much in place in that old-fashioned room. Estelle, Nan, Charles, Nirapam and Brian also flicked into sight, and they looked as much out of place as people could be. The old lady sank back in her chair and stared. Forgive the intrusion, madam, Crestomancy said. The old lady beamed up at him. What a splendid surprise, she said. No one's appeared like this for years. Forgive me if I don't get up. My knees are very arthritic these days. Would you care for some tea? We won't trouble you, madam, said Crestomancy. We came because I understand you are a keeper of some kind of way through. Yes, I am, said the old lady. She looked dubious. If you all have to use it, I suppose you have to, but it will take us hours. It's down in the cellar, you see, hidden from the inquisitors under seven tons of coal. 
I assure you we haven't come to ask you to heave coal, madam, said Crestomancy. No, Charles thought, looking at Crestomancy's white shirt cuffs. It will be us that does that. What I really need to know, Crestomancy went on, is just which world it is on the other side of the way through. I haven't seen it, the old lady said regretfully, but I've always understood that it's a world exactly like ours, only with no witchcraft. Thank you. I wonder, said Crestomancy. He seemed to have gone very vague again. What do you know of Dulcinea Wilkes? Was there much witchcraft here before her day? The Archwitch? Good gracious, yes, said the old lady. There were witches all over the place long before Dulcinea. I think it was Oliver Cromwell who made the first laws against witches, but it may be before that. Somebody did once tell me that Elizabeth I was probably a witch, because of the storm which wrecked the Spanish Armada, you know. Nan watched Crestomancy nodding as he listened to this, and realised that he was collecting symptoms again. She sighed, and wondered whether to offer to start shovelling the coal. Crestomancy sighed a little too. Pity, he said. I was hoping the Archwitch was the key to the problems here. Perhaps Oliver Cromwell... I'm afraid I'm not a historian, the old lady said firmly, and you won't find many people who know much more. Witch history is banned. All those kinds of books were burned long ago. Charles who was as impatient as Nan, butted in here. Mr. Wentworth knows a lot of witch history, but... Yes, Nan interrupted eagerly. If you really want to know, you could summon Mr. Wentworth here. He's a witch too, so it wouldn't matter. Here she realised that Brian was giving her a glare almost up to Charles Morgan's standards, and that Charles himself was staring at her wildly. Yes, he is, she said. You know he is, Brian. I met him out flying on his hearth rug last night, and he thought I was you on your broomstick. That explained everything, Charles thought. The night Mr Wentworth had vanished, he had gone out flying. The window had been wide open, and now he understood... Charles could remember distinctly the bald place in front of the gas fire where the ragged hearth rug had been. And it explained that time in detention, too, when he had thought his glasses were broken. They were broken, and Mr Wentworth had restored them by witchcraft. "'Can't you keep your big mouth shut?' Brian said furiously to Nan. He pointed to Crestomancy. "'How do we know he's safe? For all we know, he could be the devil that you summoned up.' "'Oh, you flatter me, Brian,' Crestomancy said." The old lady looked shocked. "'What an unpleasant thing to say,' she said to Brian. "'Hasn't anyone told you that the devil, however he appears, is never a perfect gentleman? Quite unlike this Mr... Uh, Mr... She looked at Crestomancy, with her eyebrows politely raised. "'Crestomancy, madam,' he said, "'which reminds me. I wish you would tell me how you came to give Estelle and Nan my name. The old lady laughed. Was that what the spell was? I had no idea. It has been handed down in my family from my great-grandmother's time with strict instructions that it's only to be used in an emergency. And those two poor girls were in such trouble but I refuse to believe you can be that old, my dear sir. Crestomancy smiled. No. Brian will be sorry to hear that the spell must have been meant to call one of my predecessors. Now, shall we go? 
We must go to your school and consult Mr. Wentworth, evidently. They stared at him, even the old lady. Then, as it dawned on them that Crestomancy was not going to let them go into the coal cellar to safety, everyone broke out into protest. Brian, Charles and Nan said, Oh no, please! The old lady said, Aren't you taking rather a risk? At the same moment as Neropam said, But I told you there's an inquisitor coming to school. And Estelle added, Couldn't we just all stay here quietly while you go and see Mr. Wentworth? Crestomancy looked from Estelle to Neropam to Nan, and then at Brian and Charles. He seemed astounded, and not vague at all. The room seemed to go very quiet and sinister and unloving. What's all this? he said. It was so gentle that they all shivered. I did understand you, didn't I? The five of you between you turn your school upside down. You cause what I am sure is a great deal of trouble to a great many teachers and policemen. You summon me a long way from some extremely important business in a manner which makes it very difficult for me to get back. And now you all propose just to walk out and leave the mess you've made. Is that what you mean? I didn't summon you, said Brian. It wasn't our fault, Charles said. I didn't ask to be a witch. Crestomancy looked at him with faint, chilly surprise. Didn't you? The way he said it made Charles actually wonder for a moment if he had somehow chosen to be born a witch. And so, said Crestomancy, you think your troubles give you a right to get this lady into much worse trouble with the Inquisitors? Is that what you all say? Nobody said anything. I think we shall be going now, Crestomancy said. If you would all hold one another's hands again, please. Wordlessly, they all held out hands and took hold. Crestomancy took hold of Brian's, but before he took hold of Estelle's in the other hand, he took the old lady's veined and knobby hand and kissed it. The old lady was delighted. She winked excitedly at Nan over Crestomancy's smooth head. Nan did not even feel up to smiling back. Lead the way, Estelle, Crestomancy said, straightening up and taking Estelle's hand. They found themselves invisible again, and the same instant they were outside in the street. Estelle set off toward Larwood House. If it had been anybody else but Estelle in the lead, Charles thought, they might have thought of taking the line of them somewhere else, anywhere else, because Crestomancy would not know. But Estelle led them straight to school, and everyone else shuffled after, too crushed and nervous to do anything else. Brian was the only one who protested. Whenever there were no people about, his voice could be heard saying that it wasn't fair. What did you girls have to fetch him for? he kept saying. By the time they were through the school gates and shuffling up the drive, Brian gave up protesting. Estelle led them to the main door, the grand one, which was only used for parents or visitors like Lord Mulk. There were two police cars parked on the gravel beside it, but they were empty and there was no one about. Here, in a sharp scuffling of gravel, Brian made a determined effort to run away. To judge by the sounds and by the way Estelle came feeling her way along Niripam and Nan, Crestomancy was after Brian like a shot. Three thumps and a scatter of small stones, and Crestomancy suddenly reappeared beside the nearest police car. He seemed to be on his own, but his right arm was stiffly bent and jerking a little as the invisible Brian writhed on the end of it. 
I do advise you all to keep quite close to me, he said, as if nothing had happened. You will only be invisible within ten yards of me. I can make myself invisible, Brian's voice said from beside Crestomancy's dove grey elbow. I'm a witch too. Quite probably, Crestomancy agreed. But I am not a witch, as it happens. I am an enchanter. And among other differences, an enchanter is ten times as strong as a witch. Who is at the end of the line now? Charles. Charles, will you be good enough to walk up the steps to the door and ring the bell? Charles trudged forward, towing the others behind him, and rang the bell. There seemed nothing else to do. The door was opened almost at once by the school secretary. Crestomancy stood there apparently alone, with his dove grey suit quite unruffled and not a hair out of place, smiling pleasantly at the secretary. It was hard to believe that he had Brian gripped in one hand and Estelle clinging to the other, and three more people crowded uncomfortably around him. He bowed slightly. Name of Chant, he said. I believe you were expecting me. I'm the Inquisitor. A teen. The school secretary dissolved into dither. She gushed. It was just as well. Otherwise she might have heard five gasps out of the air around Crestomancy. Oh, do come in, Inquisitor, the secretary gushed. Miss Cadwallader is expecting you. And I'm awfully sorry, we seem to have got your name wrong. We were told to expect a Mr Littleton. Quite right, Crestomancy said blandly. Littleton is the regional Inquisitor. But head office decided the matter was too grave to be merely regional. I'm the Divisional Inquisitor. Oh, said the secretary, and seemed quite overawed. She ushered Crestomancy in and through the tiled hall. Crestomancy stepped after her, slow and stately, in a way that allowed plenty of time for everyone to squeeze around him into the hall and tiptoe beside him across the tiles. The secretary threw wide the door to Miss Cadwallader's study. Mr. Chant, Miss Cadwallader, the Divisional Inquisitor. Crestomancy went into the study even more slowly, lugging Brian and pulling Estelle. Nan and Nirupam squeezed after, and Charles just got in too by jamming himself against the doorpost as the secretary backed reverently out. He did not want to be left outside the circle of invisibility. Miss Cadwallader sprang forward in a quite unusual flutter and shook hands with Crestomancy. The rest of them heard Brian thump away sideways as Crestomancy let go of him. Oh, good morning, Inquisitor. Morning, uh, morning, said Crestomancy. He seemed to have gone vague again. He looked absently around the room while he was shaking hands. Nice place you have here, Miss uh, uh, Cadwallander. This was true. Perhaps on the grounds that she had to persuade government officials and parents that Larwood House was a really good school, Miss Cadwallader had surrounded herself in luxury. Her carpet was like deep crimson grass. Her chairs were purple clouds of softness. She had marble statues on her mantelpiece and large gilt frames around her hundred or so pictures. She had a cocktail cabinet with a little refrigerator built into it and a coffee maker on top. Her hi-fi and tape deck took up most of one wall. Charles looked yearningly at her vast television with a crinoline doll on top. It seemed years since he had watched any television. Nan gazed at the wall of bright new books. Most of them seemed to be mystery stories. She would have loved to have a closer look at them, but she did not dare let go of Nirupam or Charles in case she never found them again. I'm so glad you approve, Inquisitor, fluttered Miss Cadwallader. My room is entirely at your disposal if you wish to use it to interview children in. I take it that you will need to interview some of the children in 6B? 
all the children in 6B, Crestomancy said gravely, and probably all their teachers too. Miss Cadwallader looked thoroughly dismayed by this. I shall expect to interview everyone in the school before I'm through, Crestomancy went on. I shall stay here for as long as it takes, weeks if necessary, to get to the bottom of this matter. By this time, Miss Cadwallader was distinctly pale. She clasped her hands nervously. Are you sure it's that serious, Inquisitor? It is only a boy in 6B who disappeared in the night. His father happens to be one of our teachers here, which is really why we're so concerned. I know you were told that the boy left a large number of notes accusing a witch of abducting him, but the police have telephoned since to say they have found a camp in the forest with the boy's scent on it. Don't you think the whole thing could be cleared up quite easily and quickly? Crestomancy gravely shook his head. I have been kept abreast of the facts too, Miss uh, Kidwelly. The boy has still not turned up, has he? One can't be too careful in a case like this. I think someone in 6B knows more about this than you think. Up to now, everyone listening had been feeling more and more relieved. If Miss Cadwallader had known there were four other people missing besides Brian, she would surely have said so. But their feelings changed at what Miss Cadwallader said next. You must interview a girl called Teresa Mullet straight away, Inquisitor, and I think you will find that the matter will be cleared up at once. Teresa is one of our good girls. She came to me during break and told me that the witch is almost certainly a child called Dulcinea Pilgrim. Dulcinea is not one of our good girls, Inquisitor, I'm sorry to say. Some of her journal entries have been very free-spoken and disaffected. She questions everything and makes jokes about serious matters. If you like, I can send for Dulcinea's journal and you can see for yourself. I shall read all the journals in 6B, said Crestomancy, in good time. But is this all you have to go on, Miss uh, Colander? I can't find a girl a witch simply on hearsay and a few jokes. It's not professional. Have you no other suspects? Teachers, for instance. Teachers here are all above suspicion, Inquisitor. Miss Cadwallader said this very firmly, although her voice was a little shrill. But 6B as a class are not. It is a sad fact, Inquisitor, in a school like this that a number of children come to us as witch orphans, having had one or both parents burned. There are an unusual number of these in 6B. I would pick out for your immediate attention Nirupam Singh, who had a brother burned, Estelle Green, whose mother is in prison for helping witches escape, and a boy called Charles Morgan, who is almost as undesirable as the pilgrim girl. Dear me, what a poisonous state of affairs, said Crestomancy. I see I must get down to work at once. I shall leave you this room of mine to work in, then, Inquisitor, Miss Cadwallader said graciously. She seemed to have recovered from her flutter. Oh, I can't possibly trouble you, Crestomancy said quite as graciously. Doesn't your deputy head have a study I could use? Intense relief shone through Miss Cadwallader's stately manner. Yes, indeed he does, Inquisitor. What an excellent idea. I shall take you to Mr. Wentworth myself, at once. Miss Cadwallader swept out of her room, almost too relieved to be stately. Crestomancy located Brian as easily as if he could see him, took his arm, and swept off after her. The other four were forced to tiptoe furiously to keep up. None of them wanted to see Mr. Wentworth. In fact, after what Miss Cadwallader had just said, the one thing they all longed to do was to sneak off and run away again. But the instant they got more than ten yards away from Crestomancy, there they would be, in riding clothes, little blue shorts and pink ball dress, for Miss Cadwallader or anyone else they passed to see. That was enough to keep them all tiptoeing hard along the corridors and up the stairs. 
Miss Cadwallader rapped on the glass of Mr. Wentworth's study. Come in, said Mr. Wentworth's voice. Miss Cadwallader threw the door open and made ushering motions to Crestomancy. Crestomancy nodded vaguely and once more made a slow and imposing entry with a slight dragging noise as he pulled the resisting Brian through the doorway. That gave the other four plenty of time to slip inside past Miss Cadwallader. I'll leave you with Mr. Wentworth for now, Inquisitor, Miss Cadwallader said in the doorway. Mr. Wentworth at that looked up from his schedules. When he saw Crestomancy, his face went pale, and he stood up slowly, looking thoroughly harrowed. Mr. Wentworth, said Miss Cadwallader, this is Mr. Chant, who is the Divisional Inquisitor. Come to my study for sherry before lunch, both of you, please. Then, obviously feeling she had done enough, Miss Cadwallader shut the door and went away. Good morning, Crestomancy said politely. Good, good morning, said Mr. Wentworth. His hands were trembling and rustling the schedules. He swallowed loudly. I, I didn't realise there were divisional inquisitors. New post, is it? Oh, do you not have divisional ones? Crestomancy said. What a shame. I thought it sounded so imposing. He nodded. Everybody was suddenly visible again. Nan, Charles and Nirupam all tried to hide behind one another. Brian was revealed tugging crossly to get his arm loose from Crestomancy, and Estelle was hanging on to Crestomancy's other hand again. She let go hurriedly and took her hard hat off. But it was quite certain that Mr. Wentworth did not notice any of these things. He backed against the window, staring from Crestomancy to Brian, and he was more than harrowed now. He was terrified. "'What's going on?' he said. "'Brian, what have you lent yourself to?' "'Nothing,' Brian said irritably. "'He isn't an inquisitor. He's an enchanter or something. It's not my fault he's here.' "'What does he want?' Mr. Wentworth said wildly. "'I haven't anything I can give him.' "'My dear sir,' said Crestomancy, "'please try and be calm. "'I only want your help.' "'Mr. Wentworth pressed back against the window. "'I don't know what you mean.' "'Yes, you do,' Crestomancy said pleasantly. "'But let me explain. "'I am Crestomancy. "'This is the title that goes with my post, "'and my job is controlling witchcraft.' My world is somewhat more happily placed than yours, I believe, because witchcraft is not illegal there. In fact, this very morning I was chairing a meeting of the Valpurgis Committee in the middle of making final arrangements for the Halloween celebrations, when I was rather suddenly summoned away by these pupils of yours. Is that why you're wearing those beautiful clothes? Estelle asked admiringly. Everyone winced a little except for Crestomancy, who seemed to think it was a perfectly reasonable question. Well, no, to be quite honest, he said. I like to be well-dressed, because I am always liable to be called elsewhere, the way you called me. But I have to confess that I have several times been fetched away in my dressing-gown in spite of all my care. He looked at Mr. Wentworth again, obviously expecting him to have calmed down by now. There are real problems with this particular call, he said. Your world is all wrong in a number of ways. That's why I would appreciate your help, sir. Unfortunately, Mr. Wentworth was by no means calm. How dare you talk to me like this, he said. It's pure blackmail. You'll get no help from me. Now that is unreasonable, sir, Crestomancy said. These children are in acute trouble. You are in the same trouble yourself. Your whole world is in even greater trouble. Please try, if you can, to forget that you have been scared for years, both for yourself and Brian, and listen to the questions I am going to ask you. But Mr. Wentworth seemed unable to be reasonable. Nan looked at him sorrowfully. 
She had always thought he was such a firm person up till now. She felt quite disillusioned. So did Charles. He remembered Mr. Wentworth's hand on his shoulder, pushing him back into detention. He had thought that hand had been shaking with anger. But he realised now that it had been terror. It's a trick, Mr. Wentworth said. You're trying to get a confession out of me. You're using Brian. You are an inquisitor. Just as he said that, there was a little tap at the door, and Miss Hodge came brightly in. She had just given 6B an English lesson, the last one until next Tuesday, thank goodness. Naturally, she had noticed that four other people besides Brian were now missing. At first, she had assumed that they were all being questioned by the Inquisitor. They were the obvious ones. But then someone in the staff room had remarked that the Inquisitor still hadn't come. Miss Hodge saw at once that this was the excuse she needed to go to Mr Wentworth and start sympathising with him about Brian. She came in as soon as she had knocked to make quite sure that Mr Wentworth did not get away again. The room, for an instant, seemed quite full of people, and poor Mr Wentworth was looking so upset and shouting at what seemed to be the Inquisitor after all. The Inquisitor gave Miss Hodge a vague look, and then waved his hand, just the smallest bit. After that, there did only seem to be the Inquisitor and Mr Wentworth in the room besides Miss Hodge. But Miss Hodge knew what she had seen. She thought about it while she said what she had come to say. Oh, Mr Wentworth, I'm afraid there are four more people missing from 6B now. And the four people had all been here in the room, Miss Hodge knew wearing such peculiar things, too. And Brian had been there as well. That settled it. Mr Wentworth might look upset, but he was not sorrowing about Brian. That meant that she either had to think of some other way to get his attention, or use the advantage she knew she had. The man who was supposed to be an inquisitor was politely putting forward a chair for her to sit in. A smooth villain. Miss Hodge ignored the chair. I think I'm interrupting a witch's Sabbath, she said brightly. The man with the chair raised his eyebrows as if he thought she was mad. A very smooth villain. Mr Wentworth said in a strangled sort of way, This is the divisional inquisitor, Miss Hodge. Miss Hodge laughed triumphantly. Mr. Wentworth, you and I both know that there's no such thing as a divisional inquisitor. Is this man annoying you? If so, I shall go straight to Miss Cadwallader. I think she has a right to know that your study is full of witches. Crestomancy sighed and wandered away to Mr. Wentworth's desk, where he idly picked up one of the schedules. Mr. Wentworth's eyes followed him, as if Crestomancy was annoying him very much, but he said in a resigned way, There's absolutely no point in going to Miss Cadwallader, Miss Hodge. Miss Cadwallader has known I'm a witch for years. She takes most of my salary in return for not telling anyone. I didn't know you... Miss Hodge began. She had not realised Mr. Wentworth was a witch too. That made quite a difference. She smiled more triumphantly than before. In that case, let me offer you an alliance against Miss Cadwallader, Mr Wentworth. You marry me, and we'll both fight her. Marry you? Mr Wentworth stared at Miss Hodge in obvious horror. Oh, no, you can't. I can't. Brian's voice said out of the air, I'm not having her as a mother. Crestomancy looked up from the schedules. He shrugged. Brian appeared on the other side of the room, looking as horrified as Mr Wentworth. Miss Hodge smiled again. So I was right, she said. Miss Hodge, Mr Wentworth said, shakily trying to sound calm and reasonable, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I can't marry anyone. My wife is still alive. 
She was arrested as a witch, but she managed to get away through someone's backyard and get to the witch's rescue service. So, you see... Well, you'd better pretend she was burned, Miss Hodge said. She was very angry. She felt cheated. She marched up to Mr. Wentworth's desk and took hold of the receiver of Mr. Wentworth's telephone. You agree to marry me, or I ring the police about you. Now! No, please, said Mr. Wentworth. I mean it, said Miss Hodge. She tried to pick the receiver up off the telephone. It seemed to be stuck. Miss Hodge jiggled it angrily. It gave out a lot of tinkling, but it would not seem to move. Miss Hodge looked around to find Crestomancy looking at her in an interested way. You stop that, she said to him. When you tell me one thing, Crestomancy said, you don't seem at all alarmed to find yourself in a room full of witches. Why not? Of course I'm not, Miss Hodge retorted. I pity witches. Now will you please allow me to ring the police about Mr. Wentworth? He's been deceiving everyone for years. But my dear young lady, said Crestomancy, so have you. The only sort of person who would behave as you do must be a witch herself. Miss Hodge stared at him haughtily. I have never used a spell in my life, she said. A slight exaggeration, Crestomancy said. You used one small spell to make sure no one knew you were a witch. Why didn't I think of that? Charles wondered, watching the look of fear and dismay grow in Miss Hodge's face. He was very shaken. He could not get used to the idea that his second witch had probably been Brian's mother. Miss Hodge once more jiggled the telephone. It was still stuck. Very well, she said. I'm not afraid of you. You can disable all the phones in the school if you like, but you won't stop me going and telling everyone I meet about you and Mr Wentworth and Brian and the other four unless Mr Wentworth agrees to marry me this instant. I think I shall start with Harold Crossley. She made as if to turn away and leave the room. It was clear she meant it. Crestomancy sighed and put one finger down on the schedule he was holding, very carefully and precisely, in the middle of one of the rectangles marked Miss Hodge 6B. And Miss Hodge was not there any more. The telephone gave out a small ding, and she was gone. At the same moment, Nan, Estelle, Nirupam and Charles all found themselves visible again. It was clear to them that Miss Hodge was not just invisible in their place. The room felt empty of her, and a small gust of wind ruffling the papers on Mr Wentworth's desk seemed to prove she was gone. Fancy her being a witch, said Nirupam. Where is she? Crestomancy examined the schedule. Oh, uh, next Tuesday, I believe. That should give us time to sort out this wretched situation. Unless we're very unlucky, of course. He looked at Mr Wentworth. Perhaps you would be ready to help us do that now, sir? But Mr. Wentworth sank into the chair behind his desk and covered his face with his hands. You never told me Mum got away, Brian said to him accusingly, and you never said a word about Miss Cadwallader. You never told me you intended to go and camp in the forest, Mr. Wentworth said wearily. Oh, Lord, where shall I get an extra teacher from? I've got to find someone to take Miss Hodge's lessons this afternoon, somehow. Crestomancy sat in the chair he had put out for Miss Hodge. It never ceases to amaze me, he said, the way people always manage to worry about the wrong things. My dear sir, do you realise that you, your son, and four of your pupils are all likely to be burned unless we do something? And here you are, worrying about schedules. 
Mr. Wentworth lifted his harrowed face and stared past Crestomancy. How did she do it? he said. How does she keep it up? How can Miss Hodge be a teacher and not use witchcraft at all? I use it all the time. How else can I have eyes in the back of my head? One of the great mysteries of our time, Crestomancy agreed. Now please listen to me. You are aware, I believe, that there is at least one other world besides this one. It seems to be your custom to send escaped witches there. I presume your wife is there. What you may not realize is that these are only two out of a multitude of worlds, all very different from one another. I come from one of the other ones myself. To everyone's relief, Mr. Wentworth listened to this. Alternative worlds, you mean? he said. There's been some speculation about that. If worlds, counterfactuals and so on. You mean they're real? As real as you are, Crestomancy said. Nirupam was very interested in this. He doubled himself up on the floor beside Crestomancy's beautifully creased trousers and said, They are made from the great events in history, I believe, sir, where it is possible for things to go two ways. It is easiest to understand with battles. Both sides cannot win a battle, so each war makes two possible worlds, with a different side winning. Like the Battle of Waterloo. In our world, Napoleon lost it, but another world at once split off from ours, in which Napoleon won the battle. Exactly, said Crestomancy. I find that world a rather trying one. Everyone speaks French there and winces at my accent. The only place they speak English there, oddly enough, is in India, where they are very British and eat treacle pudding after their curry. I should like that, Nirupam said. Everyone to his taste, Crestomancy said with a slight shudder. But, as you will see, exactly who won the Battle of Waterloo made a great deal of difference between those two worlds. And that is the rule. A surprisingly small change always alters the new world almost out of recognition, except in the case of this world of yours, where we all now are. He looked at Mr. Wentworth. This is what I need your help about, sir. There is something badly wrong with this world. The fact that witches are extremely common and illegal should have made as much difference here as it does in my own world, where witches are equally common, but quite legal. But it does not. Estelle, perhaps you can tell us about the world where the witches' rescue service sends witches. Estelle beamed up at him adoringly from where she was sitting cross-legged on the floor. The old lady said it was just like this one, only with no witchcraft, she said. And that is just the trouble, said Crestomancy. I know that world rather well, because I have a young ward who used to belong in it, and since I have been here I have discovered that events in history here, cars, advertisements, goods in shops, money, everything I can check, are all exactly the same as those in my ward's world. And this is quite wrong. No two worlds are ever this alike. Mr. Wentworth was attending quite keenly now. He frowned. What do you think has gone wrong? And Nan thought, so he was finding out symptoms. Crestomancy looked around them all, vaguely and dubiously, before he said, If you'll forgive me saying, your world should not exist. They all stared. I mean it, Crestomancy said apologetically. I have often wondered why there is so little witchcraft in my ward's world. I see now that it is all in this one. Something, I don't know what, has caused your world to separate from the other one, taking all the witchcraft with it. But instead of breaking off cleanly, it has somehow remained partly joined to the first world, so that it almost is that world. 
I think there has been some kind of accident. You shouldn't get a civilized world where witches are burned. As I said, it ought not to exist. So, as I have been trying to explain to you all along, Mr. Wentworth, I urgently need a short history of witchcraft in order to discover what kind of accident happened here. Was Elizabeth I a witch? Mr. Wentworth shook his head. Nobody knows for sure, but witchcraft didn't seem to be that much of a problem in her reign. Witches were mostly just old women in villages then. No, modern witchcraft really started soon after Elizabeth I died. There seems to have been a big increase in about 1606 when the first official bonfires started. The first witchcraft edict was passed in 1612. Oliver Cromwell passed more. There had been 34 witchcraft acts passed by 1760, the year Dulcinea Wilkes. But Crestomancy held up one hand to stop him there. Thank you. I'd know about the arch witch. You've told me what I need to know. The present state of witchcraft began quite suddenly, soon after 1600. That means that the accident we're looking for must have happened around then. Have you any idea what it might be? Mr. Wentworth shook his head again rather glumly. I haven't a notion. But suppose you did know, what could you do about it? One of two things, said Crestomancy. Either we could break this world away completely from the other one, which I don't consider a good idea, because then you would certainly all be burned. Everybody shuddered, and Charles's thumb found itself running back and forth over the blister on his finger. Or, said Crestomancy, and this is a much better idea, we could put your world back into the other one, where it really belongs. What would happen to us if you did? asked Charles. Nothing much. You would simply melt quietly into the people you really are in that world, said Crestomancy. Everyone considered this in silence for a moment. Can that really be done? Mr. Wentworth asked hopefully. Well, said Crestomancy, it can as long as we can find what caused the split in the first place. It will take strong magic. But it is Halloween, and there ought to be a great deal of magic loose in this world particularly, and we can draw on that. Yes, I'm sure it can be done, though it may not be easy. Then let's do it, said Mr. Wentworth. The idea seemed to restore him to his usual self. He stood up, and his eyes roved grimly across the riding clothes, the sky-blue shorts and Brian's jeans, and rested incredulously upon the tattered pink ball dress. If you lot think you can appear in class like that, he said. He was back to being a schoolmaster again. Uh, leave Brian, I think, Crestomancy said quickly. You will have plenty of time to reconsider in detention. Mr. Wentworth finished. Nan, Estelle, Charles and Nirupam all scrambled hurriedly to their feet, and as soon as they were standing up, they found they were wearing school uniforms. They looked around for Brian, but he did not seem to be there. I'm invisible again, Brian said disgustedly out of the air. Crestomancy was smiling. Not bad, sir, he said to Mr. Wentworth. Mr. Wentworth looked pleased, and as he shepherded the four of them to the door, he smiled back at Crestomancy in quite a friendly way. Why is Brian allowed to stay invisible? Estelle complained as Mr. Wentworth marched them back toward the classroom. Because he gives Crestomancy an excuse to go on staying here as an inquisitor, Niropam whispered. He is supposed to be finding what the witch has done with Brian. But don't tell Brian... Charles muttered as they arrived outside the door of 6B. He'd spoil it. He's like that. The truth was, he was not so sure he would not spoil things himself if he got the chance. Nothing had been changed. 
he was still in as much trouble as ever. Fourteen. Mr. Wentworth opened the door and ushered the four of them into the classroom, into a blast of stares and whispers. I'm afraid I had to kidnap these four, Mr. Wentworth said to Mr. Crossley, who happened to be teaching the rest. We've been arranging my study for the Inquisitor to use. Mr. Crossley seemed to believe this without question. 6B, to judge from their faces, felt it was an awful letdown. They had expected all four of them to have been arrested, but they made the best of it. Mr. Towers is looking for you too, Simon whispered righteously to Nirupam and Charles, and Teresa said to Estelle, Miss Phillips wants you. Nan was lucky. Miss Phillips never remembered Nan if she could help it. They had arrived back so late that there was only a short piece of lesson left before lunchtime. When the bell rang for lunch, Charles and Nirupam kept to the thickest crowds. Neither of them wanted Mr. Towers to see them. But Charles had his usual bad luck. Mr. Towers was on duty at the door of the dining hall. Charles was very relieved when he slipped past without Mr. Towers showing any interest in him at all. Nirupam nudged Charles as they sat down after Grace. Crestomancy was sitting beside Miss Cadwallader at high table, looking bland and vague. Everyone craned to look at him. Word went around that this was the divisional inquisitor. I don't fancy getting on the wrong side of him, Dan Smith observed. You can see that sleepy look's just there to fool you. He looks feeble, said Simon. I'm not going to let him scare me. Charles craned to look too. He knew what Simon meant, but he was quite sure by now that Crestomancy's vague look was as deceptive as Dan thought. Mr. Wentworth was up at high table too. Charles wondered where Brian was and how Brian would get any lunch. Charles turned back to the table to hear Teresa saying, he is so super looking, he makes me feel quite weak. To everyone's surprise, Estelle jumped to her feet and leaned across the table, glaring at Teresa. Teresa Mullet, she said, you just dare be in love with the Inquisitor and see what you get. He's mine. I met him first and I love him, so you just dare. Nobody said a word for a moment. Teresa was too astonished even to giggle. Everyone was so unused to seeing Estelle so fierce that even the monitor in charge could not think what to say. During the silence, it became clear how Brian was going to get lunch. Charles and Nirupam felt themselves being pushed apart by an invisible body. Both of them were jabbed by invisible elbows as the body climbed onto the bench between them and sat. "'You'll have to let me eat off your plates,' whispered Brian's voice. "'I hope it's not stew.' Luckily, Simon broke the silence just as Brian spoke. He said in a jeering, not-quite-believing way, "'And what took you all so long to arrange for Mr. Feeble Inquisitor?' From the way everyone looked then, Nan knew nobody had believed Mr. Wentworth's excuse for an instant. She could see most of them suspected something like the truth. Help, thought Nan. Well, we had to put a lot of electric wiring into the study, she invented hastily. He has to have a bright light arranged to shine into people's faces. It helps break them down. Not for electric shocks at all. Dan asked, hopefully. Some of it may have been, Nan admitted. There were quite a lot of bare wires and a sort of helmet thing with electrodes sticking out of it. Charles wired that. Charles is very good with electricity. And what else? Dan asked, breathlessly. He was far too fascinated by now to notice he was talking to a girl. The walls were all draped in black, 
invented Nan. Estelle and I did that. Lunch was served just then. It was potato pie. This was fortunate for Brian, who dared not use a knife and fork, but not so lucky for Charles and Nirupam. Both of them gave grunts of indignation as a large curved chunk vanished from their plates. Brian had taken a handful from each. They were more annoyed still when lumps of potato began to flop down between them. Don't waste it, snapped Nirupam. Can't you tell where your mouth is? Charles whispered angrily. Yes, but I don't know where my hands are, Brian whispered back. You try if you think you're so clever. While they whispered, Nan was being eagerly questioned by Dan and forced to invent more and more Inquisitor's equipment for Mr Wentworth's study. Yes, there were these things with little chromium screws, she was saying. I think you're right. Those must have been thumb screws. But some of them looked big enough to get an arm or a leg in. I don't think he stops at thumbs. Nirupam dug Brian's invisible side with his elbow. Listen to this, he whispered. It all has to be there if he calls Dan in. I'm not a fool, Brian's voice retorted with its mouth full. And of course there were a lot of other things we had to hang on the wall. All sizes of handcuffs, Nan went on. She was inspired now, and her invention seemed boundless. She just could not seem to stop. Charles began to wonder if one small study could possibly hold all the things she was describing, or even only the half of it that Brian managed to remember. Fortunately, Estelle, who was far too busy watching Crestomancy to eat, caused a sudden diversion by shouting out, Look, look! Miss Cadwallader's only using a fork, and he's using a knife and a fork. Oh, isn't he brave? At that, Nirupam seized the opportunity to try and shut Nan up. He gave her a sinister stare and said loudly, You realise that the Inquisitor will probably be questioning every one of us very searchingly indeed after lunch is over. Though Nirupam meant this simply as a warning to Nan, it caused a worried silence. A surprising number of people did not seem very keen on the treacle tart which followed the potato pie. Nirupam seized that opportunity too. He took third and fourth helpings and shared them with Brian. Straight after lunch, Mr Wentworth came and marshalled the whole of 6B into alphabetical order. The worried silence became a scared one. From the looks they saw on faces of the rest of the school, the scare was catching. Even seniors looked alarmed as 6B were marched away. They marched upstairs and were lined up half in the passage and half on the stairs, while Mr Wentworth went into his study to tell Crestomancy they were ready. Those at the front of the line were able to see that the wavy glass in the door was now black as night. Then it turned out that Crestomancy wanted to see them in reverse alphabetical order. They all had to march up and down and around again, so that Heather Young and Ronald West were at the front of the line instead of Geoffrey Barnes and Deborah Clifton. They did it with none of the usual grumbling and scuffling. Even Charles, who was quite certain that they were only marching to give Crestomancy time to put all Nan's inventions in, found himself a little quiet and queasy, with his thumb rubbing at that blister. Heather and Ronald looked quite ill with terror. Dan Smith, who was third now that Brian was missing, asked Nirupam in an urgent whisper, What's he going to do with us? Nirupam had no more idea than Dan. He had not even known that Crestomancy really was going to question them. He tried to look sinister. You'll see. Dan's face went cream-coloured. Crestomancy did not see people for the same length of time. Heather disappeared into the study for what seemed an endless age, and she came out as frightened as she went in. 
Ronald was only in for a minute, and he came out from behind the darkened door looking relieved. He leaned across Dan and Nirupam to whisper to Simon, No problem at all. I knew there wouldn't be. Simon lied loftily. Quiet, bellowed Mr Wentworth. Next, Daniel Smith. Dan Smith was not gone long either, but he did not come out looking as if there were no problem. His face was more like cheese than cream. Nirupam was gone for much longer than either Nan or Charles had expected. When he came out, he was frowning and uneasy. He was followed by Simon. There was another endless wait. During it, the bell rang for afternoon lessons and was followed by the usual surge of hurrying feet. The silence of lessons which came after that had gone on for so long before Simon came out that there was not a soul in 6B who did not feel like an outcast. Simon came out at last. He was an odd colour. He would not speak to any of the friends who were leaning out of the line, wanting to know what had happened. He just walked to the wall like a sleepwalker and leaned against it, staring into space. This did not make anyone feel better. Nan wondered what Crestomancy was doing to people in there. By the time the three girls who came between her and Simon had all come out looking as bad as Heather Young, Nan was so scared that she could hardly make her legs work. But it was her turn. She had to go. She shuffled around the dark door somehow. Inside, she stood and stared. Crestomancy had indeed been very busy while 6B marched up and down outside. Mr Wentworth's study was entirely lined with black curtains. A black carpet Nan had forgotten to invent covered the parquet floor. Hung on the walls and glimmering against the black background were manacles, a noose, festoons of chains, several kinds of scourge and a cat and nine tails. There was a large can in one corner labelled Petrol, Divisional Inquisitor's Office, for use in torture only. Crestomancy himself was only dimly visible behind a huge glittering lamp, which reminded Nan uncomfortably of the light over an operating table. The light from it beamed onto Mr Wentworth's desk, draped in more black cloth, where there was a sort of jeweller's display of shiny thumbscrews and other displeasing objects. The wired-up helmet was there, so was a bouquet of bare wires spitting blue sparks. Behind those was a pile of fat black books. Can you see anything Brian forgot? asked the dim shape of Crestomancy. Nan began to laugh. I didn't say the carpet or the petrol. Brian suggested a carpet, and I thought that corner looked a little bare, Crestomancy admitted. Nan pointed to the pile of black books. What are those? Disguised schedules, said Crestomancy. Oh, I see what you mean. Obviously they are acts of parliament and witchcraft edicts, torture manuals and the observer's guide to witch spotting. No inquisitor would be without them. Nan could tell from his voice that he was laughing. I accuse you of enjoying yourself she said, while everyone outside gibbers. I confess to that. Crestomancy came around the desk under the light. He pushed the spitting bunch of wires casually aside. It did not appear to give him any kind of shock, and sat on the black draped desk so that his face was level with Nan's. She suddenly found it almost impossible to look away. I accuse you of enjoying yourself too he said. Yes, I have, Nan said defiantly, for about the first time since I came to this beastly school. Crestomancy looked at her almost anxiously. You enjoy being a witch? Nan nodded vigorously. 
and you've enjoyed making things up and describing them, thumbscrews and so on? Nan nodded again. Which did you enjoy most? Crestomancy asked. Oh, being a witch, Nan declared. It's made me feel, well, just so confident, I suppose. Describe the things you've invented so far to do as a witch, said Crestomancy. I... Nan looked at Crestomancy, lit from one side by the strong light of the lamp and from the other by the flickering wires, and was rather puzzled to find how little she had done as a witch. All she had done when you came down to it was to ride a broomstick and to give herself and Estelle the wrong kind of clothes and some decidedly odd collecting tins. I haven't had much time to do things yet, she said. But Charles Morgan has had about the same amount of time, and according to the things people have been telling me, he has been very inventive indeed, Crestomancy said. Wouldn't you say that now that you've been a witch and got your confidence, you might really prefer describing things even to witchcraft? Nan thought about it. I suppose I would, she said, rather surprised. If only we didn't have to do it in our journals. Good, said Crestomancy. I think I can promise you one really good opportunity to describe things. Nothing to do with journals. I told you it would take strong magic to put this world back into the one where it belongs. When I find the way to do it, I shall need everyone's help in order to harness all the magic there is in the world to make the change. When the time comes, can I rely on you to explain all this? Nan nodded. She felt hugely flattered and responsible. While she was feeling this way, Crestomancy added, Just as well you prefer describing things. I'm afraid you won't be a witch when the change comes. Nan stared at him. He was not joking. I know you are descended from the arch-witch, Crestomancy said. But talents don't always descend in the same shape. Yours seem to have come to you in the form of making up and describing. My advice is to stick with that if you can. Now, name me one character out of history. Nan blinked at the change of subject. Uh, Christopher Columbus, she said miserably. Crestomancy took out a little gold notebook and unclipped a gold pencil. Would you mind explaining who he was? He said a little helplessly. It was astonishing the way Crestomancy seemed not to know the most obvious things, Nan thought. She told him all about Christopher Columbus as kindly as she could, and Crestomancy wrote it down in his gold notebook. Admirable, he murmured as he wrote clear and vivid. The result was that Nan went out of the study one half delighted that Crestomancy thought she was so good at describing things, and the other half desperately sad at not being a witch before long. Dan Smith's friend Lance Osgood, who was next one in, looked hard at Nan's face as she came out, and did not know what to make of it. Lance was not in the study long nor was Teresa Mullet, who came next. By this time, Estelle had just gotten up to the top of the stairs near the end of the line. Estelle craned around the corner as Teresa came out, searching for signs of love in Teresa. But Teresa looked peevish and puzzled. Everyone saw that the Inquisitor had not treated Teresa with proper respect. Delia was whispering across to Heather about it when Charles went in. Charles was not in the least frightened by this time. He was sure by now that Crestomancy was treating everybody exactly as he or she deserved. He grinned when he saw the study all draped in black and pushed his glasses up his nose to look at the things hung on the walls. Crestomancy was a dim shape behind the lamp and the spitting wires. You approve? he said. It's not bad 
said Charles. Where's Brian? Over here, said Brian's voice. Two pairs of handcuffs on the black draped wall lifted and jingled. How long is this going on? I'm magicking bored already, and you've only gotten to M. Why have you got him in here? Charles asked Crestomancy. He kept his finger on his glasses in order to give Brian his best double-barrelled glare. I have my reasons, Crestomancy said quietly. Quiet though it was, it made Charles feel as if something very cold and rather deadly was crawling down his back. I want to talk to you, Crestomancy continued in the same quiet way, about your Simon Says spell. The cold spread from Charles's spine right through the rest of him and settled particularly in his stomach. He knew that this interview was not going to be anything like the joke he had thought it would be. What about it? he muttered. I can't understand, Crestomancy said, mild and puzzled and more deadly quiet than ever. How you forgot to mention that spell. How did it come to slip your mind? It was like being embedded in ice. Charles tried to break out of the ice by blustering. There was no point in telling you. It was only a spell. It wasn't important, and Simon deserved it. And Nirapam took it off him anyway. I beg your pardon. I wasn't aware that you had a defence, Crestomancy said. Sarcasm like this is hard enough to bear, and even worse if you know someone like Brian is listening in. Charles mustered another glare, but he found it hard to direct at Crestomancy, hidden beyond the light, and swung it around at Brian again instead, or rather at the handcuffs where Brian might be. It wasn't that important, he said. Crestomancy seemed more puzzled than ever. Not important? My dear boy, what is so unimportant about a spell that could break the world up? You may know better, of course, but my impression is that Simon could easily have chanced to say something very silly, like, say, two and two are five. If he had, everything to do with numbers would have fallen apart at once. And since everything can be counted, everything would have come apart. The earth, the sun in the sky, the cells in bodies, anything else you can think of. No doubt you have a mind above such things, but I can't help finding that quite important myself. Charles glowered at the handcuffs to disguise how awful this made him feel. And Brian had heard every word. I didn't realise. How could I? Simon had it coming to him anyway. He deserved something. He was rather glad, as he said it, that no one knew he intended to do something to Dan Smith next. Simon deserved it? wondered Crestomancy. Simon certainly has a large opinion of himself, but... Brian, you tell us. You have an ego at least as big as Simon's. Do you or Simon deserve to have such power put in your hands? No, Brian's voice said sulkily. Not to destroy the world... Charles was cold all through with horror at what he had almost done, but he was not going to admit it. Nirapam took it off him, he said, before Simon did anything, really. Brian seems to be learning, Crestomancy remarked, even if you are not, Charles. I grant you that because magic is forbidden here, nobody has ever taught you what it can do or how to use it. But you could have worked it out. And you are still not thinking. Nirupam did not take that spell off Simon. 
he simply turned it back to front. Nothing, the poor boy says, comes true now. I have had to order him to keep his mouth shut. Poor boy, Charles exclaimed. You can't be sorry for him. I am, said Brian's voice. And if I hadn't been in the sick bay, I'd have tried to take it off him myself. I'd have managed better than Nirapam too. Now there, Charles, said Crestomancy, you have an excellent example, quite apart from rights and wrongs, of why it is such a bad idea to do things to people. Everyone is now sorry for Simon, which is not what you want at all, is it? No. Charles looked down at the shadowy black carpet and decided regretfully to think again about Dan Smith. This time he would get it right. Make him take the spell off Simon, Brian suggested. I doubt if he could, said Crestomancy. It's a fearsomely strong thing. Charles must have powers way up in the Enchanter class in order to have worked it at all. Charles kept his face turned to the carpet, hoping that would hide the huge, smug grin he could feel spreading on his face. It will take a number of special circumstances to get that spell off, Simon, Crestomancy continued. For a start, Charles must want to take the spell off, and he doesn't. Do you, Charles? No, said Charles. The idea of Simon having to hold his tongue for the rest of his life gave him such pleasure that he did not bother to listen to all the names Brian began calling him. He held his finger out into the lamplight and admired the way the strong light and the spitting wires made patterns in the yellow cushion of blister. Wickedness was branded into him, he thought. Crestomancy waited for Brian to run out of names to call Charles. Then he said, I'm sorry you feel this way, Charles. We are all going to need your help when we try to put this world back where it belongs. Won't you reconsider? Not after the way you went on at me in front of Brian, said Charles, and he went on admiring his blister. Crestomancy sighed. You and Brian are both as bad as one another, he said. People in Larwood House are always developing into witches, Mr Wentworth tells me, but he tells me he has had no trouble in stopping any of them giving themselves away until it came to you and Brian. Brian was so anxious to be noticed that he didn't care if he was burned. Hey, Brian said indignantly. So Crestomancy was trying to make it fair by getting at Brian now, Charles thought. It was a bit late for that. He was not going to help. So he is going to have to help or stay invisible for the rest of his life, Crestomancy went on. He ignored indignant, miserable noises from Brian and turned to Charles. You, Charles, seem to have bottled yourself up, hating everything, until your witchcraft came along and blew the stopper off you. Now, either you are going to have to bottle yourself up again or be burned, or you are going to have to help us. Since your talent for witchcraft is so strong, it seems certain that in your right world you will have an equally strong talent for something else, and you should find that easier. So which do you choose? Lose his witchcraft! Charles pressed one finger to his glasses and glared through the strong light at Crestomancy. He did not think he even hated Simon or Dan as much as he hated Crestomancy. I'm going to go on being a witch, so there! The dim shape of Crestomancy shrugged behind the light. Warlock is the usual term for people who mess about the way you do. Very well. Now, name me one historical personage, please. Jack the Ripper, snarled Charles. 
The gold notebook flashed in the lamplight. Thank you, said Crestomancy. Send the next person in as you go out. As Charles turned and trudged to the door, Brian began calling him names again. Brian, Crestomancy said quietly, I told you I would take your voice away, and I shall if you speak to anyone else. Typical, Charles thought angrily. He tore open the door, wondering what he dared do to Nan and Estelle for calling Crestomancy here, and found himself staring into Delia Martin's face. He must have looked quite frightening. Delia went white. She actually spoke to him. What's he like? Magicking horrible, Charles said loudly. He hoped Crestomancy heard him. Dean The rest of 6B shuffled slowly in and out of the study. Some came out white, some came out relieved. Estelle came out misty-eyed and beaming. Really, said Teresa, some people. Estelle shot her a look of utter scorn and went up to Nan. She put both hands around one of Nan's ears and whispered wetly, He says that where we're going, my mum won't be in prison. Oh, good, said Nan. And she thought, in sudden excitement, My mum will still be alive then. Crestomancy himself came out of the study with Geoffrey Barnes, who was last, and exchanged a deep look with Mr Wentworth. Nan could tell that he had not found out how to change the world. She saw they were both worried. Right, in line and back to the classroom, shouted Mr Wentworth. He was looking so harrowed and hurried them down the stairs so fast that Nan knew Crestomancy's luck was running out. Perhaps the real Inquisitor had arrived by now. The bell for the end of the first lesson rang as 6B marched through the corridors, which increased the urgent feeling. Other classes hurried past them and gave them looks of pitying curiosity. Simon's friends kept trying to talk to him as they went. Simon shook his head madly and pointed to his mouth. He knows who the witch is, but his lips are sealed, Ronald West said wisely. This caused Delia and Karen to skip out of line and walk beside Simon. Tell us who the witch is, Simon, they whispered. We won't say. The more Simon shook his head, the more they asked. Quiet, barked Mr Wentworth. Everyone filed into the classroom. There stood Mr Crossley, expecting to sit with 6B while they wrote their journals. You had better treat this as a free period, Harold, Mr Wentworth said to him. Mr Crossley nodded, highly pleased and went off to the staff room, hoping to catch Miss Hodge there. Poor Teddy, Estelle whispered to Nan. He doesn't know she's in next Tuesday. Mind you, I don't think she'd ever have him anyway. Crestomancy came into the classroom, looking suave and vague. No one could have guessed from the look of him that time was running out, and he was probably just as anxious as Mr Wentworth. He coughed for attention. He got instant silence, complete and attentive. Mr Wentworth looked a little envious. This is a miserable affair, Crestomancy said. We have a witch in our midst, and this witch has cast a spell on Simon Silverson. The room rustled with people turning to look at Simon. Charles glowered. Simon was looking almost happy again. He was in the limelight where he belonged. Now, most unfortunately, Crestomancy went on, someone made a well-meant but misguided effort to break the spell and turned it back to front. Nirapam looked morbid. You can't blame this person, said Crestomancy, but the result is most unhappy. It was a very strong spell. Everything Simon now says does not only not happen, but it never has happened. 
I have had to warn Simon not to open his mouth until we get to the bottom of the matter. As he said this, Crestomancy's eyes turned, vaguely and absently, towards Charles. Charles gave his blankest and nastiest look in reply. If Crestomancy thought he could make him take the spell off this way, Crestomancy could just think again. What Charles did not notice was that Crestomancy's eyes moved toward Nan after that. Nobody else noticed at all, because three people had put their hands up, Delia, Karen and Teresa. Delia spoke for all three. Mr Inquisitor, sir, we told you who the witch is. It's Nan Pilgrim. Estelle's desk went over with a crash. Books, journals, papers and knitting skidded in all directions. Estelle stood in the middle of them, red with anger. It is not Nan Pilgrim, she shouted. Nan never harmed anyone in her life. It's you lot that do the harm, spreading tales all the time. You and Teresa and Karen. And I'm ashamed I was ever friends with Karen. Nan put her hot face in her hands. Estelle was a bit too loyal for comfort. Pick that desk up, Estelle, said Mr Wentworth. Simon forgot himself and opened his mouth to make a jeering comment. Crestomancy's eyes just happened to glance at him. Simon's mouth shut with a snap, and his eyes popped. And that was all the notice Crestomancy took of the interruption. If you will all attend, he said. Everyone did, immediately. Thank you. Before we name the witch, I want you all to give the name of a second historical personage. You in the front, you begin. Uh, um, uh, Teresa, uh, a fish. Everyone had already given one name. Everyone was convinced that the Inquisitor would know the witch by the name they gave. It was obviously important not to name anybody wicked. So Teresa, although she was offended by the way the Inquisitor got her name wrong, thought very carefully indeed. And, as usually happens, her mind was instantly filled with all the villains in history. She sat there dumbly, running through Burke and Hare, Crippen, Judas Iscariot, Nero and Torquemada and quite unable to think of anybody good. Come along, uh, Tatiana, said Crestomancy. Teresa, said Teresa. And then, with inspiration, Saint Teresa, I mean. Crestomancy wrote that down in his gold notebook and pointed to Delia. Saint George, said Delia. Didn't exist in any world, said Crestomancy. Try again. Delia racked her brains and eventually came up with Lady Godiva. Crestomancy's pointing finger moved on around the class, causing everyone the same trouble. Villains poured through their minds. Attila the Hun, Richard III, Lucretia Borgia, Joseph Stalin. And when they did manage to think of anyone less villainous, it always seemed to be people like Anne Boleyn or Galileo who had been put to death. Most people did not like to mention those either, though Niropan, because he knew Crestomancy was not really an inquisitor, took a risk and said Charles I. Crestomancy turned to Mr Wentworth after most names were mentioned, and Mr Wentworth told him who they were. Most of 6B could not think why the inquisitor needed to do that, unless it was to prove that Mr Wentworth was a mastermind. But Nan thought, he's collecting symptoms again. Why? Somebody in history must be very important, I think. Charles watched Crestomancy's finger point toward him. He thought, you don't get me like that. St Francis, he said. Crestomancy's finger simply moved on to Dan Smith. Dan was stumped. Please, sir, I've got a stomachache. I can't think. The finger went on, pointing. Oh! said Dan. Uh, Dick Turpin. This evoked a gasp from 6B and a near groan of disappointment when Crestomancy's finger moved on across the gangway and pointed to Estelle. 
Estelle had picked up her desk and most of her books by now, but her knitting wool had rolled under several desks and come unwound as it went. Estelle was on her knees, reeling it in, greyer than ever, and did not notice. Nan leaned down and poked her. Estelle jumped. Is it me now? Sorry. Guy Fawkes. Has anyone had Guy Fawkes yet? She went back to her wall. One moment, said Crestomancy. A curious hush seemed to grow in the room. Can you tell me about Guy Fawkes? Estelle looked up again. Everyone was looking at her, wondering if she was the witch. But Estelle was only thinking about her wool. Guy Fawkes, she said. They put him on a bonfire for blowing up the Houses of Parliament. Blowing them up, said Crestomancy. But Guy Fawkes never managed to blow up Parliament in any world I ever heard of. Simon opened his mouth to say Estelle was quite right, and shut it again hastily. Estelle nodded. A number of people called out, Yes, sir, he did, sir. Crestomancy looked at Mr. Wentworth. Mr. Wentworth said, In 1605, Guy Fawkes was smuggled into the Parliament cellars with some kegs of gunpowder in order to blow up the government and the king. But he seems to have made a mistake. The gunpowder blew up in the night and destroyed both houses without killing anyone. Guy Fawkes got out unhurt, but they caught him almost at once. It sounded like all the other times Mr. Wentworth had told Crestomancy a piece of history. But somehow it was not. Crestomancy's eyes had a special gleam, very bright and black, and he looked straight at Nan as he remarked, A mistake, eh? That doesn't surprise me. That fellow Fawkes never could get anything right. So this is the world where he got things wronger even than usual. He pointed at Nan. Richard the Lionheart, said Nan, and she thought, He's got it. Guy Fawkes is the reason our world went different. But why? He'll want me to describe it, and I don't know why. She thought and thought while Crestomancy was collecting names no one needed now from the rest of 6B. November 5th, 1605. All Nan could remember was something her mother had once said long ago before the Inquisitor took her away. Mum had said November 5th was the last day of Witch Week. Witch Week began on Halloween, and today was Halloween. Did that help? It must do, though Nan could not see how. But she knew she was right, and that Crestomancy had found the answer, because he had such a smooth, pleased look as he stood beside Mr Wentworth. Now, he said, we shall reveal the witch. He had gone vague again. He was slowly fetching a slim golden case from a dove grey pocket, and if he was looking at anyone, it was at Charles now. Good, thought Nan. He's giving me time to think. And Charles thought, All right, reveal me then, but I'm still not going to help. Crestomancy held the flat gold box out so that everyone could see it. This, he said, is the very latest modern witch finder. Look at it carefully. Charles did. He was almost certain that the witch finder was a gold cigarette case. When I let go of this machine, Crestomancy said, it will travel by itself through the air, and it will point to everyone in turn, except Simon. When it points to a witch, it is programmed to make a noise. I want the witch it points to to come and stand beside me. 6B stared at the gold oblong, tense and excited. There were gasps. It had bobbled in Crestomancy's hand. Crestomancy let go of it, and it stayed in the air, bobbing about by itself. Charles glowered. He understood. Brian! Brian was going to carry it invisibly around. 
That did it. If Crestomancy thought he could get around Charles by giving Brian all the fun, he was going to be really disappointed. The bobbing case upended itself. Charles saw it split open a fraction along the top edge as Brian took a quick peep to see if it was indeed a cigarette case. It was. Charles glimpsed white cigarettes in it. Off you go, Crestomancy said to it. The gold box shut with a loud snap, making everybody jump, and then travelled swiftly to the first desk. It stopped level with Ronald West's head. It gave out a shrill, beeping sound. Everybody jumped again, including Ronald and the gold box. Come out here, Crestomancy said. Ronald, looking quite dumbfounded, got out of his desk and stumbled towards Crestomancy. I never... he protested. Yes, you are, you know, Crestomancy said. And he said to the gold box, Carry on. A little uncertainly, the box travelled to Geoffrey Barnes. It beeped again. Crestomancy beckoned. Out came Geoffrey, white-faced but not protesting. How did it know? He said drearily. Modern technology, said Crestomancy. This time the gold box went on without being told. It beeped, moved and beeped again. Person after person got miserably up and trailed out to the front. Charles thought it was a dirty trick. Crestomancy was just trying to break his nerve. The box was level with Lance Osgood now. Everyone waited for it to beep. And waited. The box stayed beside Lance, pointing until Lance's eyes were crossed with looking at it. But nothing happened. Go on, said Crestomancy. He's not a witch. The box moved to Dan Smith. Here it made the longest, loudest noise yet. Dan blenched. I covered up my tracks, he said. Out here, said Crestomancy. Dan got up slowly. It's not fair, my stomach aches. No doubt you deserve it, said Crestomancy. By the noise, you've used witchcraft quite recently. What did you do? Only hid a pair of running shoes, Dan mumbled. He did not look at Charles as he slouched up the gangway. Charles did not look at Dan either. He was beginning to see that Crestomancy was not pretending that people were witches. By now, the front of the class was quite crowded. The box went to Nirupam next. Nirupam was waiting for it. It beeped even louder for him than it had for Dan. The moment it did, Nirupam got up and fled with long strides to the front of the room in order not to be asked what witchcraft he had done. Then the box came to Charles. The noise was deafening. All right, all right, Charles muttered. He, too, trudged to the front of the class. So, Crestomancy was playing fair, but he was still obviously trying to teach Charles a lesson by devaluing witchcraft. Charles looked around at the other people standing out in front. He knew his was the strongest magic of the lot, and he wanted to keep it. There were still a thousand things he could do with it. He did not want to blend with another world, even if they did not burn witches there. As to being burned, Charles looked down at his blister. He found he rather enjoyed being frightened once he got used to it. It made life interesting. Meanwhile, the gold box followed Charles down the gangway and pointed to Delia. There was silence. Delia did not try to hide her smirk but the smirk came off her face when the box moved to Teresa. It gave one small, clear beep. Teresa stood up, scandalised. Who, me? Only a very small, third-grade sort of witch, Crestomancy told her comfortingly. It did not comfort Teresa in the least. 
If she was to be a witch, she felt she should at least be a first-class one. It was a disgrace either way. She was really angry when the box moved to Karen and did not beep for Karen either. But she was equally annoyed when the box went on and beeped for Heather, Deborah and all her other friends. She stood there with the most dreadful mixed feelings. Then the box beeped for Estelle too. Teresa tossed her head angrily, but Estelle sprang up, beaming. Oh, good, I'm a witch, I'm a witch! She skipped out to the front, grinning all over her face. Some people, Teresa said unconvincingly. Estelle did not care. She laughed when the box beeped loudly for Nan, and Nan came thoughtfully to join her. I think most people in the world must be witches, Estelle whispered to her. Nan nodded. She was sure it was true. She was sure this fitted in with all the other things Crestomancy had discovered, but she still could not think how to explain it. This left four people scattered about the room. They were all, even Simon, looking peevish and left out. It's not fair, said Karen. At least we won't be burned, said Delia. Crestomancy beckoned to the box. It wandered up the gangway and put itself in his hand. Crestomancy put it back in his pocket while he looked around the crowd of witches. He ignored Charles. He had given him up. He looked at Nan and then across at Mr Wentworth, who had been crowded against the door in the crush. Well, Wentworth, he said, this looks quite promising, doesn't it? We've got a fair amount of witchcraft to draw on here. I suggest we make our push now. If Nan is ready to explain to everyone... Nan was nothing like ready. She was about to say so when the classroom door flew open. Mr Wentworth was barged aside, and Miss Cadwallader stood in his place, stiff and upright and stringy with anger. What are you all doing, 6B? she said. Back to your seats with the utmost rapidity. Mr Wentworth was behind the door, white and shaking. Everyone looked doubtfully at Crestomancy. He had gone very vague. So everyone did the prudent thing and scuttled back to their desks. As they went, three more people came into the room behind Miss Cadwallader. Miss Cadwallader faced Crestomancy in angry triumph. Mr Chant, she said, you are an imposter. Here is the real Inquisitor, Inquisitor Littleton. She stood aside and shut the door so that everyone could see the Inquisitor. Inquisitor Littleton was a small man in a blue pinstriped suit. He had a huge man on either side of him in the black uniform of the Inquisition. Each of these huge men had a gun holster, a truncheon, and a folded whip in his belt. At the sight of them, Charles's burned finger doubled itself up and hid inside his fist like a guilty secret. You move and I'll order you shot! Inquisitor Littleton snapped at Crestomancy. His voice was harsh. His little watery eyes glared at Crestomancy from a little blunt face covered with bright red veins. His blue suit did not fit him very well, as if Inquisitor Littleton had shrunk and hardened some time after the suit was bought into a new shape, dense with power. Good afternoon, Inquisitor, Crestomancy said politely. I'd been half expecting you. He looked across his shoulder to Simon. Nod if I'm right, he said. Did you say an Inquisitor would be here before lunch? Simon nodded, looking shattered. Inquisitor Littleton narrowed his watery eyes. So it was witchcraft that made my car break down, he said. I knew it. He unslung a black box he was carrying on a strap over his shoulder. He pointed it at Crestomancy and turned a knob. Everyone saw the violent twitching of the dials on top. Thought so, grated Inquisitor Littleton. It's a witch.
He jerked his blunt chin at Mr. Wentworth. Now get me that one. One of the huge men reached out a huge hand and dragged Mr. Wentworth over from beside the door as easily as if Mr. Wentworth had been a guy stuffed with straw. Miss Cadwallader looked as if she would like to protest about this, but she gave it up as useless. Inquisitor Littleton trained his black box on Mr. Wentworth. Before he could turn the knob, the black box was torn out of his hands. With its broken strap trailing, it hurried from the Inquisitor to Crestomancy. I think that was a mistake, Brian, said Crestomancy. Both huge men drew their guns. Inquisitor Littleton backed away and pointed at Crestomancy. His face was purple and full of a queer mixture of hate and horror and pleasure. Look at that, he shouted out. It has a demon to wait on it. Oh, I've got you now. Crestomancy looked almost irritated. My good man, he said, that really is a most ignorant assumption. Only a hedge wizard would stoop to using a demon. I'm not a demon, shouted Brian's shrill voice. I'm Brian Wentworth. Delia screamed. The huge man who was not holding Mr. Wentworth seemed to lose his nerve. Glaring with fear, he held his gun out in both hands and aimed it at the black box. Throw it, said Crestomancy. Brian obeyed. The black box sailed towards the window. The huge man was muddled into following it around with his gun. He fired. There was a tremendous crash. Quite a few people screamed this time. The black box exploded into a muddle of wire and metal plates and half of the window blew out. A gust of rain blew in. You fool, said Inquisitor Littleton. That was my very latest model witchfinder. He glared at Crestomancy. Right, I've had enough of this foul thing. Get it for me. The huge man put his gun back in its holster and marched towards Crestomancy. Neropam quickly stuck up a long arm. Please, just a moment. I think Miss Cadwallader may be a witch too. Everyone at once looked at Miss Cadwallader. She said, How dare you, child! But she was as white as Mr. Wentworth. And this, Nan realised, was where she came in. She was not sure how, but she surged to her feet all the same, in such haste that she nearly knocked her desk over like Estelle. Everyone stared at her. Nan felt terrible. For a long, long instant, she went on standing there without a thought in her head and without one scrap of confidence to help her. But she knew she could not just sit down again. She began to talk. Just a moment, she said. Before you do another thing, I've got to tell you about Guy Fawkes. He's the reason almost everybody in the world is a witch, you know. The main thing about Guy Fawkes is that he was the kind of man who can never do anything right. He meant well, but he was a failure. Make that girl shut up, Inquisitor Littleton said in his harsh, bossy voice. Nan looked at him nervously, and then at the two huge men. None of them moved. In fact, now that she looked, everyone seemed to be stuck and frozen exactly where they were when she first stood up. She looked at Crestomancy. He was staring vaguely into the distance, and did not seem to be doing anything either. But Nan was suddenly sure that Crestomancy was somehow holding everything in one place to give her a chance to explain. That made her feel much better. She had gone on talking all the time she was looking around, explaining about the gunpowder plot and what a mistake the conspirators made choosing Guy Fawkes to do the blowing up. Now she seemed to be going on to explain about other worlds. There were an awful lot of Guy Fawkeses in an awful lot of worlds, she heard herself saying. 
and he was a failure in every one. Some people are like that. There are millions of other worlds, you know. The big differences get made at the big events in history, where a battle gets either won or lost. Both things can't happen in one world, so a new one splits off and goes different after that. But there are all sorts of smaller things that can go two ways as well, which don't make a world split off. You've probably all had those kinds of dreams that are like your usual life, except that a lot of things are not the same, and you seem to know the future in them. Well, this is because these other worlds where two things can happen spread out from our own world like rainbows and sort of flow into one another. Nan found herself rather admiring this description. She was inspired now. She could have talked for hours. But there was not much point unless she could persuade the rest of 6B to do something. Everyone was just staring at her. Now, our world should really just be a rainbow stripe in another proper world, she said. But it isn't. And I'm going to tell you why. So that we can all do something about it. I told you Guy Fawkes was a failure. Well, the trouble was, he knew he was. And that made him very nervous, because he wanted to do at least this one thing right and blow up Parliament properly. He kept going over in his mind all the things that could go wrong. He could be betrayed, or the gunpowder could be damp, or his candle could go out, or his fuse might not light. He thought of all the possibilities, all the things that make the rainbow stripes of not quite different worlds. And in the middle of the night, he got so nervous that he went and lit the fuse just to make sure it would light. He wasn't thinking that November 5th, the day he was doing it, was the last day of Witch Week, when there is so much magic around in the world that all sorts of peculiar things happen. Well, somebody silence that girl, said Inquisitor Littleton. He made Charles jump. Charles had been sitting all this time, trying to understand the way he was feeling. He seemed to have divided into two again, but inside himself, where it did not show. Half of him was plain terrified. It felt as if it had been buried alive in screaming, shut-in despair. The other half was angry. Angry with Crestomancy, Miss Cadwallader, 6B, Inquisitor Littleton, everything. Now, when Inquisitor Littleton suddenly spoke in his loud, grating voice, Charles looked at the Inquisitor. He was a small man with a stupid face, in a blue suit which did not fit, who enjoyed arresting witches. Charles found himself remembering his first witch again, the fat man who had been so astonished at being burned. And he suddenly understood the witch's amazement. It was because someone so ordinary, so plain stupid as Inquisitor Littleton, had the power to burn him. And that was all wrong. Oh, come on, all of you, said Nan. Don't you see? When Guy Fawkes lit that fuse, that made a new spread of rainbow possibilities. In our proper world, the world we ought to belong to, the fuse should have gone straight out again, and the Houses of Parliament would have been perfectly safe. But once the fuse was alight, the night watchman could have smelled it, or Guy Fawkes could have put it out with water, or the thing could have happened which made us the way we are. Guy Fawkes could have stamped the fuse out, but left just one tiny spark alight, which went on burning and creeping towards the kegs of gunpowder. I told you to shut that girl up, said Inquisitor Littleton. Charles was in one piece again now. He looked from the Inquisitor to Crestomancy. Crestomancy did not look so elegant just then. His suit was crumpled as if he had fallen away inside it, and his face was pale and hollow. Charles could see sweat on his forehead. And he understood that Crestomancy was putting out a huge effort and somehow holding the whole world still.
to give Nan time to persuade 6B to use their combined witchcraft to change it. But 6B were still sitting there like dumb things. That was why Inquisitor Littleton had started talking again. He was obviously one of those people who were very hard to keep quiet, and Crestomancy had had to let go of him in order to have strength to hold everything else. "'Will you be quiet, girl?' said Inquisitor Littleton. "'Boom!' said Nan, and up went Parliament, but with no people in it. It wasn't very important, because even Guy Fawkes wasn't killed. But remember, it was Witch Week. That made it a much worse explosion than it should have been. In it, this whole stripe of the rainbow where we are now, and all the magic anywhere near, got blown out of the rest of the world like a sort of long-coloured splinter. But it wasn't blown quite free. It was still joined to the rest of the rainbow at both ends. And that's the way it still is. And we could put it back, if only we could make it so that the explosion never happened. And because it's Halloween today, and there's even more magic about than usual... Charles saw that Crestomancy was beginning to shake. He looked tired out. At this rate, Crestomancy was not going to have any strength left to put their splinter of world back where it belonged. Charles jumped up. He wanted to apologise. It was obvious that someone with power like Crestomancy's could easily have just gone away the moment Inquisitor Littleton arrived. Instead, he had chosen to stay and help them. But saying he was sorry would have to wait. Charles knew he had to do something. And, thanks to Nan, he knew just what to do. Sit down, boy, rasped Inquisitor Littleton. Charles took no notice. He dived across the gangway and took hold of Simon Silverson by the front of his blazer. Simon, say what Guy Fawkes did, quick! Simon gazed at Charles. He shook his head and pointed to his mouth. Go on, say it, you fool! said Charles, and he shook Simon. Simon kept his mouth shut. He was afraid to say anything. It was like a bad dream. Say what Guy Fawkes did! Charles yelled at him. He gave up shaking Simon and poured witchcraft at him to make him say it. And Simon just shook his head. Niropam saw the point. Say it, Simon, he said. And that made all the rest of 6B understand what Charles was trying to do. Everyone stood up in their seats and shouted at Simon, Say it, Simon! Mr Wentworth shouted. Brian's voice joined in. Witchcraft was blasting at Simon from all sides, and even Karen and Delia were shouting at him. Nan joined in the shouting. She was bubbling with pride and delight. She had done this just by describing what happened. It was as good as witchcraft any day. Everyone had understood that they could make this world part of the other one again, part of the world to which the witches rescue service sent witches by making Simon say what had not happened in that other world. Say it, Simon! Everyone screamed. Simon opened his mouth. I... Oh, leave off! He was terrified of what might happen. But once he had started to speak, all the witchcraft beating at him was too much for him. He... He... Guy Fawkes blew up the Houses of Parliament. Everything at once began to ripple. It was as if the world had turned into a vast curtain, hanging in folds, with every fold in it rippling in and out. The ripples ran through desks, windows, walls and people alike. Each person was rippled through. They were tugged and rippled again until everyone felt they were coming to pieces. By then the ripples were so strong and steep that everyone could see right down into the folds. 
For just a moment, on the outside of each fold, was the classroom everyone knew, with the Inquisitor and his huge men on the same fold as Miss Cadwallader, and Crestomancy on another fold beside them. The inner parts of the folds were all different places. Charles realised that if he were going to apologise to Crestomancy, he had better do it at once. He turned around to say it. But the folds had already rippled flat, and nothing was the same any more. Steen. I'm very sorry, sir, said one of the boys. He sounded as if he meant it for a wonder. Mr. Crossley jumped and wondered if he had been asleep. He seemed to have had that kind of shiver that makes you say, someone walked over my grave. He looked up from the books he was marking. The janitor was in the classroom. What was his name? He had a raucous voice and a lot of stupid opinions. Littleton, that was it. Littleton seemed to be clearing up broken glass. Mr. Crossley was puzzled because he did not remember a window being broken. But when he looked over at the windows, he saw one of them was newly mended, with a lot of putty and many thumbprints. There you are, Mr. Crossley, all tidy now, Mr. Littleton rasped. Thank you, Littleton, Mr. Crossley said coldly. If you let Littleton get talking, he stayed and tried to teach the class. He watched the janitor collect his things and back himself through the door. Thank goodness. Thank you, Charles, said someone. Mr. Crossley jerked around and discovered a total stranger in the room. This man was tall and tired-looking and seemed from his clothes to be on his way to a wedding. Mr. Crossley thought he must be a school governor and started to stand up politely. Oh, please, don't get up. Crestomancy said, I'm just on my way out. He walked to the door. Before he went out of it, he looked around 6B and said, If any of you want me again, a message to the old gatehouse should find me. The door closed behind him. Mr. Crossley sat down to his marking again. He stared. There was a note on top of the topmost exercise book. He knew it had not been there before. It was written in ordinary blue ballpoint, in capital letters, and it gave Mr. Crossley the oddest feeling of having been in the same situation before. Why was that? He must have dozed off and had a dream. Yes, now Mr. Crossley thought about it, he had had the strangest dream. He had dreamed he taught in a dreadful boarding school called Larwood House. He looked thankfully up at the bent, busy heads of 6B. This was, as he well knew, Portway Oaks comprehensive, and everyone went home every evening. Thank goodness! Mr. Crossley hated the idea of teaching in a boarding school. You were always on the job. He wondered who had written the note. And here, as his eyes went over the class, he had a momentary feeling of shock. A lot of faces were missing from his dream. He remembered a batch of tiresome girls, Teresa Mullet, Delia Martin, Heather something, Karen something else. None of them was there. Nor was Daniel Smith. Ah, but Mr. Crossley remembered now. Dan Smith should have been there. He was in the hospital. Two days ago, the stupid boy had eaten a handful of tin tacks for a bet. No one had believed he had at first, but when Mr. Wentworth, the headmaster, had put Dan in his car and driven him to be x-rayed, there he was, full of tin tacks. Idiots, some boys were. And here was another mad thing about Mr. Crossley's dream. He had dreamed that Miss Cadwallader was head in place of Mr. Wentworth. Quite mad! Mr. Crossley knew perfectly well that Miss Cadwallader was the lady who ran the gatehouse school for girls, where Eileen Hodge was a teacher. Come to think of it, 
That must have been why he dreamed of Teresa Mullet and her friends. He had seen their faces staring out at him from the prim line of girls walking behind Eileen Hodge. And now Mr Crossley remembered something else that almost made him forget his dream and the mysterious note. Eileen Hodge had at last agreed to go out with him. He was to call for her on Tuesday because she was going away for half term. He was getting somewhere there at last. But even through his pleasure about Eileen, the dream and the note kept nagging at Mr Crossley. Why should it bother him who had written the note? He looked at Brian Wentworth, sitting next to his great friend Simon Silverson. The two of them were giggling about something. The note was quite probably one of Brian's jokes, but it could equally well be some deep scheme masterminded by Charles Morgan and Nirupam Singh. Mr Crossley looked at those two. Charles looked back at Mr Crossley over his glasses and across the piece of paper he was supposed to be writing on. How much did Mr Crossley know? Charles's writing had gotten no further than the title, Halloween Poem. Neither had Nirupam's. On the floor between them was a pair of spiked running shoes and, filling them with wonder, was the name marked on the shoes. Daniel Smith. Both of them knew that Dan did not own any running shoes. Of course, Smith was not exactly an uncommon name, but both of them were struggling with strange double memories. Charles wondered particularly at the sense of relief and peace he had. He felt at ease inside. He also felt rather hungry. One part of his memory told him that this was because Brian Wentworth had invisibly eaten half his lunch. The other half suggested that it was because Chess Club had taken up most of the dinner hour. And here was an odd thing. Up till that moment, Charles had intended to be a chess grandmaster. Now those double memories caused him to change his mind. Someone, whose name he could not quite remember now, had suggested to him that he was going to have a very strong talent indeed for something, and it was not for chess, Charles was sure now. Perhaps he would be an inventor instead. Anyway, the chess club half of his memory, which seemed to be the important half, suggested that he hurry home early so he could eat the last of the cornflakes before his sister Bernadine hogged them. Guy Fawkes, Nirupam murmured. Charles did not know if Nirupam was referring to witchcraft or to Dan Smith's idea of half-term. They had been going to collect money for the guy, using Nirupam for a guy. Nirupam, in the Morgan's old stroller, made a beautiful, long, thin, floppy guy. Now they were both wondering if they would have the nerve to do it on their own without Dan to keep them up to it. Why did you have to bet Dan he couldn't eat tin tacks? Charles whispered to Nirupam. Because I didn't think he would, Nirupam answered grumpily. He had been in a lot of trouble with Mr Wentworth about that bet. Could we get Estelle and Nan to help push me? They're girls, Charles objected. But he considered the idea while he underlined Halloween poem in red ink with blood drops. Those two girls might just do it at that. As he inked the last drop of blood, he noticed a blister on his finger. It had reached the flat, white, empty stage by now. Carefully, Charles inked it bright red. He was not sure he wanted to forget about things that soon. Mr Crossley was still considering the note. It could be another flight of fancy from Nan Pilgrim. Nan, as usual, since she had arrived at the school from Essex at the beginning of term, was sitting next to Estelle Green. They were thick as thieves, those two. A good thing, because Estelle had been rather lonely before Nan arrived. Nan glanced up at Mr Crossley, and down again at her pen rushing across her paper. Fascinated, she read... And in this part of the rainbow, Guy Fawkes stamped the fuse out, but a little tiny smouldering spark remained. 
The spark crept and ate its way to the kegs of gunpowder. Boom! Estelle, look at this! Estelle leaned over, looked and goggled. Do you know what I think? she whispered. When you grow up to be an author and write books, you'll think you're making the books up, but they'll all really be true somewhere. She sighed. My poem's going to be about a great enchanter. Mr. Crossley suddenly wondered why he was worrying about the note. It was only a joke after all. He cleared his throat. Everyone looked up, hopefully. Somebody, said Mr. Crossley, seems to have sent me a Halloween message. And he read out the note. Someone in this class is a witch. 6B thought this was splendid news. Hands shot up all over the room like a bed of bean sprouts. It's me, Mr. Crossley. Mr. Crossley, I'm the witch. Can I be the witch, Mr. Crossley? Me, Mr. Crossley. Me, me, me. The End You have been listening to Witch Week by Diana Wynne-Jones, narrated by Gerard Doyle. This book is copyrighted 1982 by Diana Wynne-Jones. This recording is copyrighted 2004 by Recorded Books.